Good afternoon, and I'm going to ask for IT to help us. And we've been helped by Equin. Thank you very much, Equin. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is afternoon on Tuesday, March 28th for our afternoon session of the Council. Welcome to all of you who are joining us. Uh, there have been a few additions to the agenda, and so before we get to public hearings on a few pieces of legislation, uh, I want to start out by saying that on Friday, the county executive disapproved a member of the planning board, James Hedrick, whom the council had supported just a few weeks prior. Um, this is part of the checks and balances of local government, uh, and it is because the planning board is incredibly vital to the functions of county life. Um, and we want to make sure that there is a functioning planning board to help build the homes, approve the homes and commercial properties in our community, make sure that our parks are well maintained, um, and project a vision for what the community will look like in the years and decades to come. That is why our planning board is critically important and that is why the appointments of planning board members is one of the most important things that we as council members have to do. Um, and when the county executive disapproved a member of the planning board, um, it is up to us to determine the path forward. Uh, and so uh, I have added it back to the agenda so that we can have a conversation about having a full complement of five members of the planning board recognizing their work is incredibly important. And so with that, uh, I will open it up for any comments. Uh, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I was sorry to see that the county executive and James Hedrick did not have a good interview and discussion with each other. I respect the county executive's opinion but I felt that Mr. Hedrick, during the County Council interview, did a very good job in giving his thoughts on the Planning Board and on community engagement. Over the last several days, I, and I know all of us probably, have heard from many on both sides about Mr. Hedrick's appointment. I know that James Hedrick is devoted and committed to improving the lives of all of our residents in Montgomery County. He is a career public servant dedicated to community development and affordable housing. Over the years, I have seen he and his family at various events. I know that he and his wife moved to Rockville in 2014 to start their family in Twinbrook. In, he became involved with his community. He served on the he's serving on the board of the Twinbrook Community Association. His life experience has been economic development and working in housing for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Federal Housing uh, Finance Agency, Chair of the Rockville Housing Enterprises, Rockville's Public Housing Authority. I believe he knows that it is very important to all of us as a planning board member to do the job in a proper and thorough manner and to listen and engage the public. For these reasons and more, Mr. President, I move the adoption of the resolution to reaffirm an appointment to Maryland National Capital Park and Planning under Section 15301 of the Land Use Article be approved. Thank you, Mr. President. Motion's been moved by Councilmember Katz. Uh, Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. I strongly second that motion. Um, I know that, that Mr. Hedrick did an impeccable job here in his presentation before us, and that he understands the importance of this role and the work to be done moving forward on this uh, planning board. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President. Just uh, the Council took serious and deliberative action to reset the planning board. Um, and we did it together, the, um, the previous Council, and appointed temporary members to help rebuild the public trust. It was mentioned how important this role is. Uh, on the first day of the 20th Council, I, uh, I, along with other colleagues, called for more transparency in how we operate as a Council and 
my colleagues and I use the new rules we've established to have a more public conversation uh, in the case of the planning board appointments. A uh, part of the small d democratic process is recognizing that the will of the body prevails even when it differs from our individual preference. Uh, people often quote in the Washington Post headline is that democracy dies in dark darkness. It can also die in disorder and dysfunction. Uh, and while I appreciate the county executive's input on this and other items, I don't agree with his veto. And I think it will only perpetuate disorder at a time when we need our planning board to function well to meet the needs of our region. Uh, while I supported uh, Ms. Branson uh, in our new council planning board process, I did also uh, put forward for an interview Ms. Mr. Hendrick. And I think he's qualified uh, and hopefully, uh, as all of us should do in our lives, will learn from this discussion and proceed in a way that is honorable and in a way that includes community <laughs> input. Um, so I want to uh, remind all of our recent appointees, in fact, to take heed of the council's swift action to reset the planning board when that didn't happen. Um, and uh, we don't want to go down that path again. So we all need to be collaborative and work together on the behalf of all of our residents. So I will be voting in favor of this resolution and just wanted to clarify where I stood. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Councilmember Mink. Thank you, Council President. Um, I, too, was excited to have two extraordinary finalists from the pool of Democratic applicants um, for the Open Planning Board seat. Both Dr. Hedrick and former Councilmember Sheree Branson have long histories of public service in government and volunteer service in their communities. And uh, it is a testament to the talent that exists in our county. Dr. Hedrick brings important perspectives, including from his work in the Department of Housing and Urban Development and in affordable housing financing. As a chair of Rockville Housing Enterprises, the city of Rockville's public housing agency, he's been a partner with the county in financing and building innovative mixed income public housing. In the past three years, the median price of a home rose by over $100,000. And the median earning household in the county now struggles to purchase a home, pushing them into the rental market or out of our county entirely. We have growing agreement that aggressive action must be taken to control housing costs, and it's my belief that this includes both providing stability and predictability for our existing renters, half of whom are cost burdened, and producing more housing at every level of affordability, especially affordable and deeply affordable housing. I'm confident that Dr. Hedrick will be an asset in advancing innovative strategies to address these needs from his position on the planning board. And that is why I will vote to return him to the planning board so he may continue that important work on behalf of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'll just be brief, and I will vote for this resolution for all the reasons, reasons that were stated so eloquently by my colleagues just now. The county executive did also reference in his letter concerns about social media posts about Dr. Hedrick, and I will note some of those social media posts were directed at me uh, as the former president of this council. And as we were going through very uh, emotional and difficult conversation around Thrive, that comes with the territory. Uh, for better or worse, uh, of being a public official. And I don't feel that any of those social media posts were out of bounds. Um, but we all have to recognize, and as Councilmember Jawando stated, uh, the importance of positive discourse. Things are very toxic right now in so many different areas. Feels like you could light a match and things could get on fire right now. And so uh, I as Councilmember Chawandu also stated, um, noted that in the last year, the previous planning board went through an unprecedented level of challenges with interpersonal attacks um, that were destructive to the body and destructive to our county. And they will not be tolerated moving forward. And so I have every bit of confidence that this newly appointed planning board will follow the tradition of previous planning boards uh, in moving forward in a professional manner the very important work that they must embark on to begin enacting policies within Thrive. And I look forward to working with Dr. Hedrick and the two other newly appointed members and the two soon to be appointed members um, to advance that cause. So with that, I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, joining us virtually is our colleague, Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Uh, good morning. It's 1.30 a.m. in Taiwan. Uh, mm. I'm a former member, member of the planning board, 
it's key to have people with diverse views on the planning board. That discussion that you have, because you know people have different backgrounds, it's crucial to move us forward and I'll be voting um, to keep Mr. Hendrick on the planning board. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, colleagues, uh, for, for the motion, uh, for your comments. Uh, moving forward, uh, an affirmative, uh, an affirmation of the resolution will require nine votes uh, to restore Mr. Hedrick to the planning board. I will be supporting him in this motion. Uh, you know, members of the planning board, individual members of the planning board cannot singularly represent all the diverse views of our community. That's why we have five planning board members. Uh, and I look forward to them collaboratively and collegially uh, working together on behalf of our diverse community. Uh, not seeing any other comments, uh, this is a hand vote. So all those in favor of the resolution to reaffirm an appointment under Section 15103 of the Land Use Article of the Maryland Code signify by raising your hand. And Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez, and that is unanimous. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Now we can get to what everyone else is here for. Um, item number 17, that is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY23 operating budget for the Department of Health and Human Services and the statewide integrated health improvement strategy, eliminating disparities in mental health initiative and home visiting expansion in the amount of $214,000 and $4. Uh, action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. We have one speaker, and that is Kelly Hudson, who is joining us virtually. Hi, can you hear me? Thank you. So I'm here today to request that the Montgomery County Council amends the County Executive's operational budget for the Black Physicians Health Network by awarding an additional $1 million to support the provision of health care subsidies for number one, health and dental visits for uninsured Black residents who are pending health insurance coverage, number two, for emergency funds for insured Black residents who request support with a copay and or high cost deductible due to financial hardship. And lastly, for emergency and tailored mental health appointments for black residents who receive services from a black mental health professional. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Uh, this hearing is now closed. Can I have a motion? Uh, second. Moved, uh, moved by Council Vice President Friedson, seconded by Council Member Sales. All those in favor? And that is unanimous by all those present. And she, okay, uh, that is unanimous by everybody. Um, next is item number 18. This is a public hearing on a declaration of no further need disposition of Pepper Ridge property in the Emory Grove area of Gaithersburg. A government operations and fiscal policy committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. Those wishing to submit additional materials for the council's consideration must do so by the close of business on April 4th. We have no speakers and this public hearing is now closed. Uh, next, this is item number 19. This is a public hearing on Bill 1523, Landlord-Tenant Relations Anti-Rent Gouging Protections. This bill would establish protections against rent increases above a threshold for a certain rental unit, set the base rent amount for certain rental units, provide exemptions from rental increase restrictions for certain rental units, permit certain rental increases to fund capital improvements, require landlords to submit annual reports regarding rents, and generally amend county law concerning rents and landlord-tenant relations. A planning, housing, and parks committee work session is tentatively scheduled for June 15th. Those wishing to submit additional materials for the council's consideration must do so before the close of business on June 8th. We have 11 speakers for this item. Uh, I'm gonna call down five individuals who are all present. Scott Bruton, 
Carmen Larson, Billy Irinpour, Matt Losak, and Matt Losak. Oh, the one and only. Uh, and as you all come yeah. down, uh, I believe Councilmember Fani Gonzalez, who is still with us, would like to make a quick comment. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, for, uh, President Evans. Uh, hold, hold, Council Member, hold on one sec so we can hear you. Get the audio set up in here. You want to try it again? Can you hear me now? Okay. Keep talking. Hello, one, two, three. We hear you. You do? Okay. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, again, thank you so much for the opportunity. I wish I could be there today um, in this um, council. Uh, delegation trip to Taiwan with a county executive. I am committed to hear the entire public hearing once I'm back and just wanted to um, reassure you that. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, we'll start with Mr. Bruton. You have three minutes. Good afternoon, Council President Class and Council Members. My name is Scott Bruton, Acting Director of the Department of Housing and Community Affairs, DHCA. I am testifying on behalf of, county of the County Executive in support of Bill 1623, Landlord-Tenant Relations, Rent Stabilization, or the Home Act, with comments on Bill 1523, Landlord-Tenant Relations, Anti-Gouging Protections. Given the affordable housing crisis in Montgomery County, our region, and the nation, it is heartening that the County Executive and a significant majority of the Council agree that limits on rent increases must be placed. The regulation of rent increases is not only a matter of stabilizing housing affordability, but also a matter of racial equity and social justice. Approximately 35% of county residents are renters. Almost exactly half, 49%, are housing costs burdened, paying more than 30% of their income for housing. And 23% are severely housing costs burdened, paying 50% or more of their income for housing. For renters making less than $75,000 annually, 84% are housing cost burdened, and non-white racial and ethnic groups are far more likely to be renters in the county. Our analysis of more than 100,000 units in 23 communities across the county found that only Tacoma Park, which has had rent stabilization since 1980, has rental housing affordable to the average household for all racial and ethnic groups. In every other community, the median rent leaves the average black or Hispanic renter cost burdened. Bill 1523 and the HOME Act both contain standard elements of rent stabilization legislation, but differ in their implementation of each. Both bills set annual maximum rent increases for regulated rents. Bill 1523 would set the maximum at the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, plus 8%. The HOME Act would set the maximum at 3%, or the increase in the rental component of the CPI, whichever is lower. The lower maximum rent increases allowed by the HOME Act would significantly assist low and moderate income black and Hispanic households who are disproportionately renters in the county. The HOME Act would also have a stabilizing effect on approximately 37% of rent increases that fell outside the historic averages for both the rent component of the CPI and the actual average rent increases in Montgomery County while Bill 1523 would only limit the approximately 7% of rent increases that are roughly 10% or higher. Both bills contain an exemption for new construction, an important provision that is standard in rent stabilization programs across the country. The new construction exemption provides adequate time for lenders and investors to receive their return and set the rents to encourage continued investment in rental housing production. The HOME Act ensures that landlords can make a fair return on their investments. It allows landlords to petition for a fair return on investments and provide detailed criteria for determining the base net operating income of the property and calculating rent increases beyond the maximum annual to maintain it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. We have a lot of folks to get through today. Okay, uh, council, uh, council member, uh, Ms. Larson. <laughs> yeah, yes you do. You have three minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is Carmen Larson. I'm president of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce from Montgomery County. 
and um, here to testify um, in some form between these two <laughs> bills. So I'm going to take it from the Home uh, Act bill and use that as a baseline um, because both of them have merit. Uh, I want to talk about two parts of the issue. One of them is um, I'm here representing some people who are renting, renters, particularly one lady that we've been helping with the chamber a lot. Uh, she's a retired social worker. Her income is her social security plus some savings that afford her to have an additional $1,000. So her income is $3,200 a month. She's currently paying $1,560 a month, $1,560. She got notified that upon renewal, her rent would be $1,980 a month. Um, that's a 27% increase. Uh, we've spoken to the landlord who said that's the market rate and too bad. Uh, there's no other recourse. The voluntary rent guideline that I was suggested to inform the landlord about doesn't mean a thing because it's not regulated. It's a, it's a, it's a sub suggestion. So um, we are supportive of the landlord because they have expenses that are increasing as well. So um, the chamber feels that um, it would be fair to have the consumer um, price index as a measure and we understand that Montgomery County is a little higher uh, but at least uh, maybe 3% is too low for some of the things that they think about. Um, I would just, we, we would just like you to consider the Home Act with a little maybe a, a couple of points higher uh, to, to compensate for that. Uh, the, pro the problem that we see and I just want to make sure that I share this with you is that I know that the county needs income from people who are who have properties and are paying taxes on those properties. So I know it's important that we don't have suddenly people leaving the county who are who have buildings or are developers because they give us some income for our county to spend on people who have needs in our county as well as the infrastructure. So I think it's important that we do something to make sure that they have something that they need to, to, to grow and to keep their business up. The people who are here in the county who are renting because they can't afford to buy uh, and who are retired uh, and who don't want to go to the housing that they need to give up all their savings to in order to qualify for, um, you know, they need, they need some support as well. But they can't go and get another job if they're either retired or disabled. They can't say, well, maybe I'll just get a raise or maybe I'll just do an extra job on the side. They're not able to do that, right? So whereas the, the landlord and the people in business do have some options. They can reduce expenses. They can find other ways of increasing or widening their business base. So they have more leeway on, on, on getting you know, getting better and more return. So, your, Ms. Larson, your time is expired. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, Ms. Arampour. Good afternoon, County President Class and County Council. My name is Billy Arampour, and I'm testifying today on behalf of Greater Capital Area Association of Realtors, GCAR, which is 12,000 members, realtors, property managers, title attorneys, and other real estate professionals to express our concerns regarding rental regulations put forward in Bill 1523 and 1623. GCAR, like many others testifying today, cannot sign on to these bills as wholesale supporters. Decades of economic data show that rent control worsens housing shortages, drives up costs of rental housing, and decreases the quality of existing rental housing stock. Rental regulations like these are artificial efforts to regulate a rental marketplace in Montgomery County that is already setting a good pace for itself. As noted multiple times, the average rent increase over the last 10 years is 2.1%. Proponents of Bill 1623 point to a handful of examples of bad actors in property manage management space, many of which take place in municipalities that would still be exempt from such action. Let us be clear, there are property owners that rent gouge far and few in between, which is both bad for business, bad for the industry, and bad for the community. But over-regulation based on anecdotal evidence is simply bad governance. While Council has wisely requested a report from the Office of Legislative Oversight regarding the rental market in our county, we are faced with not one but two bills further regulating marketplace before it's even complete. 
While many factors are causing our shortage of units and rising rents, there needs to be a collaborative approach taken with housing providers and developers. Let's work on how to build more affordable and attainable housing instead of driving business out of the county. The Council needs to set its focus on meeting the housing goals set forth in Council of Government's report. Instead, we are here discussing regulations that could further threaten housing affordability and our role as an economic engine in the state and region. With all of this in mind, it is clear the Council is set on passing something to further regulate the rental marketplace of the two pieces of legislation before us. Bill 1523 will weed out bad actors in the industry and maintain Montgomery County as a place for long-term property management investments. In conjunction with the massive tax burdens under deliberation in the coming weeks, we urge the Council to think deeply about the message legislation like this sends about how Montgomery County means business. Thank you again for your work to keep Montgomery County a welcoming place for all, and please do not hesitate to reach out to me or the association if we can be helpful in any way. Thank you. Mr. Losak. Uh, good afternoon, County uh, Pre Council President Glass and County Council Vice President Friedson and Council members. My name is Matt Losak, and I am the co-founder and executive director of the Montgomery County Renters Alliance. We are the first and only regional nonprofit dedicated exclusively to renter outreach, education, organizing, and advocacy, and we represent the interests of nearly 40% of county residents who rent their homes. The Council has it before it today a historic opportunity to demonstrate its off-stated belief that stable, affordable rental housing both is a right and necessary for community health, welfare, and prosperity. It is obvious to the vast majority of residents in this county that raising rents excessively is a profiteering gouge. The Renters Alliance has been clear, as we stated in our memo to the Council some weeks ago, that we understand and support a landlord's right to maintain a profit margin and keep up with legitimate expenses. But there is no justification for the kinds of rent increases we are seeing around the county and that have become clearly unaffordable to many, as above 3% and most 5 8 and 10% and well above that too, in the double digits. It is doubtful that any council member on this dais or any homeowner would support or sustain yearly mortgage increases at these levels. Yet the so, the so named anti-rent gouging bill legitimizes excessive rent gouges that renters will be required to bear and will likely force them out of their homes. It would be simply unconscionable for the council to support rent increases of 8% plus CPIU. The majority of renters are seniors, working and low-income families, individuals, and people of color. It is doubtful the Council can square its support for racial equity with the devastating impact excessive rent increases will have on the racial divide. The Council acknowledges shortages of teachers, police, other moderate and low-wage workers who cannot afford to rent, much less buy here. And, and just this Sunday, the Council's leadership discussed nexus, the nexus of housing instability to rising gun violence and crime, homelessness, safety net costs, threats to academic achievement for children in our schools. We know the opposition's talking points alleging the rent stabilization will mean a reduction in investment, yet there is ample evidence that demonstrates the opposite. We ask you to consider these proposals and this evidence in good faith. Each of you was elected, at least in part, on the basis of your support to protect and preserve affordable housing. We urge you to scrap the increased formula in this bill and combine the best elements of both bills to a permanent rent stabilization program that eliminates excessive rent increases and expands these protections to all rental households. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. <laughs> Next. Next, I'd like to uh, call up Lindsay Bowie, Carrie Kasicki, Carlos Orbe, and Brian Onlu. Ms. Bowie, we begin with you. You have three minutes. Thank you. H Hello, and thank you for hearing my testimony. 
My name is Lindsay Bowie. My husband and I and our two small children are renters and we live in Gaithersburg. I am here to speak in favor of the HOME Act. We reside in an elementary school district that includes only one multi-family property, which is ours. That means being forced out of my home would mean that my child changes schools. This situation is just one aspect of the quote, often unequal bargaining power between landlords and tenants, end quote, mentioned in our county code. We hear a lot from landlords about the possibility of losses, hypothetical situations about what may or may not be built, or how much profit a landlord may or may not make. But what about the real losses of moving kids from one school to another? What, a, what about all the value we lose if we just look the other way while hundreds of low-income families quietly move away because they cannot afford the rent? It may not be as easy to quantify that kind of value, but I know it's a far greater loss than any of the doomsday economic predictions landlords offer to the press. With 40% of the student body of my son's school living at our apartment complex alone, mass evictions directly affect our education system, impacting student success, teacher retention, and direct services that families need to access. We just received an 8% rent increase. We are blessed to be able to handle it at this time, but our landlord has made it clear that they plan to continue increasing the rent year after year. A community that allows continued year after year increases of 8%, 10%, or 12% is not serious about allowing renters to have a permanent home. Indeed, members of this council have stated they believe a 10% increase could be considered a constructive eviction, and I would agree. The Home Act's proposed 3% cap sends the message that we don't just see renters as temporary visitors or people making a stop on the way to affordable housing. Instead, we see renters as long-term residents who have rights and bring real value to our communities. This is not something that just affects Gaithersburg or Silver Spring. It is happening all over the county, not just affecting families, but seniors and veterans as well. Basic protections for renters are not a partisan issue because housing is a human right. Our county code calls upon our officials to facilitate fair and equitable arrangements between landlords and tenants to prevent a lot of heartache and pain for a lot of people. Uh, that is why it is imperative that we act now. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, Ms. Boo. <laughs> Ms. Kosicki. Um, good afternoon. My name is Carrie Kosicki. Can you hear me with the mic from here? Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Smarter Growth, um, offering testimony on both Bills 1523 and 1623. Um, our mission as CSG is to advocate for walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented communities as the most sustainable and equitable way for our region to grow. Um, so I want to begin by thanking the tenant leaders and the organizers who are here today who have worked hard to make both of these bills possible. Um, none of this would be happening without your work. That the fact that all of us are here having this conversation is a credit to you um, and an important reminder that regardless of the positions that any of us are starting from today, um, we have the shared goal to make sure that the policy we end up on addresses the concerns raised by tenants as the people most affected. Um, so addressing Montgomery County's housing shortage is a key part of CSG's work in Montgomery County. Um, and our affordability problems are in part a supply problem. We don't have enough housing to meet demand, and that means not only that we see rising rents, but that we see limited alternatives and ultimately limited power for tenants. Um, rent stabilization is best understood as a stability policy and not an affordability policy. It can be successful in the short term to reduce tenant displacement, um, which is important, but we also need to pair it with complementary policies to address the underlying long-term structural shortage that makes housing unaffordable. Um, so to address long-term affordability, rent stabilization should not discourage new housing development, and it needs to be paired with policies that affirmatively encourage new housing development. Um, in terms of addressing the immediate problem through a rent stabilization policy, CSG would recommend um, an allowed rate of 3 to 5 percent plus CPI, along with a 15-year exemption for new construction. Um, we recommend that this exemption be tied to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the 15-year exemption. Um, we believe that these measures will make it possible to continue with new construction, that we need to address long-term affordability, while also providing meaningful stability to today's uh, residents. 
And if we're going to set the limit at something like 3 to 5 percent plus CPI, then what we're doing is acknowledging that incentivizing new construction is, is an important part of our long-term housing affordability solution, um, which means that that can't just be a talking point if that's a central part of our housing affordability plan. We need to follow through by investing in solutions to build more housing, um, and especially more affordable housing. We think the county is on the right track for this, um, with things like the Attainable Housing Strategies Initiative, um, to allow more varieties of multifamily housing in more parts of the county. Um, we'd like to see some work on encouraging ADU development through incentives and regulatory reform, um, as well as eliminating parking requirements near transit, which can reduce the cost of new units in transit accessible locations. Um, we've submitted these recommendations and other recommendations in our written testimony to the council with additional details. Um, so overall, to restate CSG's recommendations, we'd be supportive of a bill that exempts new construction for a reasonable number of years, um, which we would note that both bills we feel already do exempt construction for a reasonable number of years, um, and that sets the allowed rate at around 3 to 5 percent plus CPI. And we would like to continue in this work to be in conversation with council members, tenant leaders, and organizers as partners as we work on long-term housing affordability solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Orbe. Uh, yes, my name is Carlos Orbe Jr. and I am the Public Affairs and Communications Specialist for Maryland Latinos Unidos, MLU, a program housed at Maryland nonprofits representing over 300 Latino community leaders, business owners, and Latino led nonprofits. MLU's mission is to unify efforts across the state to advocate and organize for the benefit of Maryland's Latinos community using data driven and evidence based approaches. We raise voices. Seeing as we are one of the main at-risk populations impacted by rent gouging practices, we acknowledge and support the benefits of anti-rent gouging, which is part of the Tenant Protection Package in Bill 1523. At every stage of researching Bill 1523, MLU noted a common theme of rent and housing barriers that directly impact the socioeconomic progression of vulnerable communities within our bountiful state. All Marylanders deserve stable, affordable housing and a roof over their heads. With the lack of long-term policy that accommodates and encourages a variety of economic conditions, we must yet again prepare for the fight of our lives. Additionally, we are nearing a depleted emergency rental assistance fund that thus far prevented over 100,000 evictions across the state. More than 108,000 households remain behind on their rent in Maryland. The majority are families with children. Tens of thousands of mostly black and Latina families will face eviction and homelessness. At-risk communities now require new tenant protection. Apart from a brief period during the pandemic, historically, Montgomery County has had no rent caps and most landlords currently have no restrictions regarding rent increases. Bill 1523 adds protections against abusive practices. This bill will provide direct assistance to the most vulnerable of residents, protect them against rent gouging, provide access to home ownership to build generational wealth, and increase the supply of income-restricted affordable housing. I need not remind everyone here that eviction and rent gouging have catastrophic impacts on health, educational outcomes, public safety, and community stability. Bill 1523 addresses our concerns directly. The communities that Maryland Latinos Unidos represents provide critical services to the county, contributing to its overall lifestyle and well-being. We are the frontline workers. We are the food source behind your meals. We are the labor behind the luxury and the ones who go unnoticed for your comfort that you all enjoy routinely. Yet we do not have the basics to take care of ourselves. If we do not have access to the basics of human life, we ourselves as a community cannot be sustained. We ask for a favorable vote and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Orba. Uh, final, finally on this panel, Mr. Anilu. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Brian Anlu, and I'm here on behalf of the Apartment and Office Building Association in Metropolitan Washington. AOPA is a nonprofit trade association representing the owners and managers of more than 133,000 apartment units and over 23 million square feet of office space in Prince George's and Montgomery counties. In Montgomery County, AOBA members own or manage over 60,000 of the county's estimated 83,000 rental units and 20 million square feet of office space. Our housing providers take pride in providing safe and sanitary, professionally managed homes for their residents. However, the two proposed bills threaten their ability to continue to maintain these high standards. Rent regulations have a well-documented history of negatively impacting the supply of housing. 
deterring investments in capital improvements, and leading to a decline in the overall quality of housing stock. Why would the county could contemplate such a perilous co course of action when the risk is completely unjustified by present market conditions? Data shows that housing providers have been offering lease renewal rates well below the rate of inflation in the very modest range of 3 to 5%. 35%. Rent increases, rents increased by 1.8% in 2020 and subsequently increased by 9.9% 9, 9 in 2021. This increase can be attributed to rents having been artificially suppressed during the pandemic and promotional rates and concessions expiring. Other large reported increases were for new leases rather than lease renewals. Many of the largest increases are in newer Class A housing stock, which tends to house higher income residents that can afford to pay the higher premium of living in these buildings. Since that time, rent increases have come back in line with historical trends at 2.6% in 2022. And economists project that downward trend to continue. To the extent that the council wants to punish bad actors, it should focus on those issuing the largest increases of 15% or more without accompanying capital improvements to justify such increases. New construction should also be exempted for a minimum of 20 years. Anything short of this would have devastating consequences on the rental housing market and the county's economic competitiveness. A rent control cap of 3% or less would be particularly harmful. In 2015, IOPA commissioned a study on the economic and fiscal impact of rent control through Towson University. The study concluded that rent control would result in a $10.4 billion loss in economic output over 10 years. More recent economic data points in Montgomery County uh, falling behind neighboring jurisdiction, particularly those in Northern Virginia where regulatory environments are far less restrictive. According to former council analyst Jason, Jacob Sesker, the output of the county's construction and real estate industries declined by 23% and 29% respectively below 2017 levels. In comparison, the national construction and real estate industries have grown by 2.2 and 6.4% over the same period. If those industries had grown locally at the same rate that they did nationally, the county's economy would be 8.2% larger than it currently is, and perhaps a property tax increase would not be necessary. Passing rent control here will only make these numbers worse. The National Apartment Association recently conducted interviews with housing providers and developers in three markets with rent control. 71% of the providers surveyed have or expect to reduce their investments in those markets. 67% were forced to or are expecting to defer non-essential maintenance and improvements. And more than half of the housing providers were aware of higher income residents benefiting from rent control. This is problematic because rent control has been found to reduce mobility and unit turnover, which Mr. further reduces housing options for low and moderate income residents. Mr. Enler. Thank you. We ask you to oppose these needless and harmful rent regulations. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. We have two more individuals who are present uh, for this hearing. Uh, I'd like to invite Bettina Guevara up and also Mario Alvarado, who will have interpretation, uh, language interpretation. Oh, uh, Council Member Katz, sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to be very clear that uh, 1523 and 1623 is county legislation. This gets a little confusing, but if the resident is in the municipal boundaries of municipalities, then they're going to be governed by their own legislation and not necessarily by this legislation. Um, and that's why there are certain municipalities through, that have had their own legislation uh, and uh, that this would not automatically be in any of the municipal uh, uh, boundary, a, a residence that's inside a municipal boundary. Thank you, Ms. Bruce. Thank you. Um, we'll start with Ms. Guevara. Good afternoon. My name is Bettina Guevara, and I am the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of BF Saul Company, a local owner and developer of commercial real estate. I also have a very unique experience, which is um, I am a child of immigrant parents and I lived in a two-bedroom apartment with my parents uh, and my three siblings um, as a child. So I know what it is to have to, um, to pay the monthly, the monthly rent and, and struggle to pay that. We recognize the affordable housing challenges facing Montgomery County today, but we're here to advocate for a practical and pragmatic solution that will address the housing pipeline and that will allow development and growth. Anything less will result in a policy that will stifle growth and will reduce economic stability in the county. 
Today, inflation is causing significant cost increases and rising interest rates, resulting in challenging times to deliver affordable housing. We believe in sound strategies to deliver affordable housing, including increased county rental assistance, increase access to home ownership, create affordable housing funds for nonprofits to build and preserve affordable housing. In addition, we do not believe in taking advantage of vulnerable members of our community and support anti-gouging guidelines that protect residents from those who exploit them. But anti-gouging legislation must be well thought out so it does not have a detrimental impact on the development of new projects. Any artificial low cap on rent escalation will dampen investments. Anti-gouging guidelines must also be sensitive to unforeseen economic events faced by developers and the guidelines should allow for the recovery of losses in the early years of development. Please note that as part of any project's approval process, developers commit at their sole cost and expense to deliver major public improvements and community benefits. Again, we ask to work with the county to achieve meaningful legislation to advance affordable housing opportunities that protect our vulnerable residents while at the same time not alienate the investment and lending communities. We believe working together to face this challenge is essential when crafting a comprehensive solution going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Alvarado. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Mario Alvarado Villa, residente del condado de Montgomery y líder comunitario. Me opongo rotundamente al proyecto de ley 1523. Como inmigrante y servidor de esta comunidad, veo de cerca y a diario los retos de familias de escasos recursos, latinas, negras y de muchas otras comunidades inmigrantes del condado. Good afternoon. My name is Mario Alvarado Villa. I am a Montgomery County resident and a community leader. I am absolutely against Bill 1523. As an immigrant who serves this community, I see on a daily basis the challenges faced by low-income families who are Latino, Black, and from many other immigrant communities in this county. COVID nos dejó grandes lecciones sobre cómo actuar en caso de emergencia, pero también sacó a la luz los vulnerables y poco preparados que estamos para situaciones inesperadas. Miramos gente morir, personas perder su trabajo y cientos de, cientos de familias que sin misericordia fueron arrojados a la calle. Quizás no conocen de cerca lo horrible que es que lo tienen a la calle sin tener a dónde ir. Lo traumatizante que esto es para nuestros hijos y las secuelas que dejan de por vida en ellos. Peor aún, saber que no se tiene dinero para buscar otro lugar a donde llevar a su familia. Tienen que ir a sus comunidades para verlo de cerca. Los invito al Distrito 6, a donde yo vivo, ya que tiene casos todos los días. Por cierto, somos una fuerza laboral crucial para este distrito y el resto del condado. COVID has taught us big lessons about how to respond to emergencies, but it also brought to light how vulnerable and ill-prepared we are when it comes to uncertainties. We saw people die, lose their jobs, and hundreds of families who, without mercy, were thrown out on the street. Perhaps you are not aware of how evictions work. You don't know how horrible it is to have everything thrown outside. This is very traumatizing for children and the lifelong lingering effects it brings. Even worse, it's not having enough money to find a new place to take your family. You have to see this firsthand. I invite you to District 6, where I live, as they, there are evictions happening every day. By the way, the immigrant community is an economic engine crucial to the district and to the rest of the county. Rentar un apartamento en el condado no es nada asequible. El promedio de renta es de 1.788. Ganando el salario mínimo, un trabajador tendría que trabajar 93 horas semanales y 2.3 trabajos a tiempo completo. Para poder costear un apartamento de dos cuartos, en sus mismas ses sesiones se dieron a conocer datos, estos datos, sobre cómo las comunidades de color son las que tienen más dificultades y están fuertemente agobiadas por el costo de la renta de los latinos, de los eh, latinos que representan el 59% están agobiados por el costo de la renta. Para personas de bajos recursos no es fácil sobrevivir. Renting an apartment is not affordable. It is estimated that the average rent is $1,788 per month. A worker who earns minimum wage must work 90, 
93 hours a week and will need to have more than two full-time jobs to be able to afford a two-bedroom apartment in this county. In your own sessions, it was shared how communities of colors are the ones who are most rent burned. Of Latino renters, 59% are rent burned. It is not easy for low income people to survive in this county. Para nosotros poder hacer los 150 mil dólares anuales que ustedes ganan como concejales, tendríamos que trabajar día y noche por lo menos tres años. Descuidando nuestros hijos y nuestra salud, lastimosamente sus salarios no son un reflejo de la comunidad a la que sirven y las decisiones que están tomando afectan el futuro de quienes los pusieron en esa silla, los votantes. Sus decisiones tampoco son un reflejo de las necesidades de quienes los eligieron. For us to be, for us to be able to make 150,000 annually, which is what you all make, we will need to work day and night for at least three years and have to neglect our children and put our health at risk. Unfortunately, your salaries are not a reflection of the communities you serve. The decisions you are taking are affecting the future of those who put you there. Your decisions are also not a reflection of the real needs out there. La falta de preparación financiera de la comunidad latina afecta a su crédito. La falta de documentos legales para quienes no los tienen le cierra las puertas para andar aplicando en varios complejos de apartamentos o buscando opciones más baratas. Nuestra realidad no es como la de ustedes. Un incremento del 8%, más inflación en la renta, no es consistente con nuestro salario ni, contra, ni con nuestra capacidad de pago. Lack of financial planning in the Latino community affects them building and having good credit. Lack of legal documentation also closes doors as, as there are limited options. Our reality is not yours. An 8% increase plus inflation is not consistent with our salaries or our ability to pay. Un gran porcentaje de nosotros votamos y nuestros hijos también votan. Este proyecto de ley es una puñalada para nosotros, los pobres, y duele más viniendo de un inmigrante que se supone que sobre la realidad que conoce la realidad de los pobres. No todos tenemos el privilegio de pasar con un salario de limpieza a 150 mil dólares anuales. Ni nacimos con papeles por años. Hemos tenido un consejo susceptible a los retos de familias de escasos recursos y a la comunidad inmigrante. Pero ahora con este cambio en el consejo, nuestro futuro es incierto. Lamentablemente hay intereses de por medio que afectan la vida de quienes no tenemos el poder. A great percentage of us are voters and have children who also vote. This proposed bill backstabs our low income communities and it hurts even more coming from an immigrant council member who should understand her plea who is, she is supporting this not all of us have the pri privilege to go from earning a cleaning salary to 150,000 a year or we're born here to have documentation with this council we have an uncertain future unfortunately there are interests at play that affect those who have less power no soy enemigo de ustedes, soy enemigo de las injusticias y de la falta de empatía. No subestimen a los pobres. Nuestro trabajo es el que sostiene este condado. I am not your enemy. I am an enemy of the injustices and the lack of empathy. Do not underestimate low income communities as our work is the backbone of this county. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Ms. Avila, you'll come back on the next panel. Right, okay, very good. Um, and we have one more speaker who will be, thank you all okay. very much. Uh, we have one more speaker who is virtual, and that is Ariana Royster. Good afternoon, Council President. Good afternoon, members of the County Council. My name is Ariana Royster, and I'm the president of Georgia Residential. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on Bills 15-23 and 16-23. I can support the anti-rent gouging legislation that will protect families from bad actors that seek to exploit residents. However, the proposed legislation is somewhat concerning in terms of the CPI plus 8% formula in lieu of a flat 15% cap. A primary concern is ensuring financing remains available to developers so housing production can increase across all segments, both affordable and market rate. Preservation of existing affordable housing through the use of the county's first right, right of first offer can be the most efficient means of increasing our stock of affordable housing as well as levels of affordability. I encourage the county to create a task force to study and implement 
a wide range of counting tools to achieve more units at all levels of affordability. These tools, at a minimum, can each realize additional affordable units and or lower affordability. Land use, create incentives to preserve existing affordable housing while encouraging expansion and redevelopment. Land, contribute land in lieu of sale. Low income housing tax credits, ensure the county utilizes all of its 9% LIHTC every year and provide gap financing. The expansion of all housing is essential to the county's long-term health. The expansion of affordable housing and helping those challenge, rent challenged is our collective responsibility. I oppose Bill 16-23. While rent control appears to assist current residents in the short run, in the long run it decreases affordability, fuels gentrification, and creates negative spillovers on the surrounding jurisdiction. Rent control policies generally lack means testing, creating inherent inequalities by allowing high income households to compete with low-income households for rent-controlled apartments. Rent stabilization laws often establish a price ceiling that is far below the market rent level and therefore disincentivizes new development, which is catastrophic for the multifamily housing market. In summary, rent stabilization is a complex and controversial policy with both supporters and opponents. While it can provide benefits for residents, it can also have unintended consequences for the housing market and the overall economy. The implementation of this bill would reduce the quality of rent controlled housing because of the lack of investment in existing housing and new development. I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Royster, and thank you for everybody who testified on Bill 1523. That public hearing is now closed. We will now go to public hearing on Bill 1623, Landlord-Tenant Affairs, Rent Stabilization, the Home Act. This bill would establish an annual maximum rent increase for rental housing in the county, provide exemptions for certain buildings from rent stabilization requirements, permit a landlord to submit a petition for a fair rent increase, establish an excise tax for vacant rental units, specify the use of certain tax revenues for the acquisition of affordable housing, and generally amend county law concerning rent increases, landlord-tenant relations, and taxation. A Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee work session is tentatively scheduled for June 15th. Those wishing to submit additional materials for the Council's consideration must do so before the close of business on June 8th. We have 14 individuals who'd like to speak on this. I'll invite the first five down. Uh, Delegate Gabriel Acevedo, Jeff Zients, Christine Pengench, Lily Goldstein, and Kayla Mock. Welcome everybody. Del Delegate Acevedo, you have three minutes. Thank you so very much, uh, Council President and Honorable Members uh, of the Montgomery County Council. For the record, Delegate Gabriel Acevedo from District 39 uh, here in support of Council Bill 1623, the Home Act. Um, I'd like to thank all of the sponsors for bringing this, uh, this very critical piece of legislation forward. Um, and for the record for folks, um, District 39 is the northwestern part of uh, our county. Uh, it is one of the most diverse. It is also a very working class district. And I'm not only proud to serve uh, as its delegate, but um, to represent uh, the people whose um, actions by this council uh, you know, would not only be impacted or um, uh, lack of action would also be impacted. And to be clear, when we say District 39, we're talking about Gaithersburg, Montgomery Village, uh, Washington Gro Grove, Clarksburg, uh, and Germantown. Uh, I just want to uh, say really quickly that um, we all know we live in a very expensive county. Uh, this is not news to anyone uh, on the dais, um, but 
the reason why I'm here is because I think there's ample evidence, there's ample, ample study that exists that shows uh, the average American cannot afford a $500 or more unexpected bill. Um, and the reality of it is that there have been uh, significant rent increases for the people that we represent, that I represent, um, that uh, not only has become burdensome, but folks aren't able to make rent. Um, and so I'm in support of 1623, which establishes an annual maximum rent increase cap of 3% with consideration and alternative options provided for landlords in unique situations through the fair return petition. Uh, the Home Act, as, as it is appropriately titled, is all about public safety, uh, keeping people in their homes, addressing the issues of the unhoused, um, has direct links to community safety uh, as well as resources. As a renter, I have seen my neighbors and my rent go up as much as $350 or more uh, this year alone. Some of my neighbors uh, not only know who I am but have approached me about the rent increases um, and it's been really disheartening to be able to tell uh, not only constituents that I represent but my neighbors that what landlords are doing um, is certainly well within the law. Um, as a renter, not just, you know, being able to, 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 to make ends meet, but understanding that a lot of my constituents um, aren't making enough in order to live in our very expensive county. Uh, and so we not only need uh, stronger renter protection laws, but we need rent stabilization that is capped uh, at 3%. Um, Prince George's County, as you all know, recently passed rent stabilization. Um, and I think it's something that we can not only applaud our neighbors on, but certainly follow suit. Um, Montgomery County renters deserve stability and predictability in their housing, um, just as landlords deserve a fair return on their investment. And the Home Act provides for both renters and landlords to share in the benefits of affordable and, uh, and sustainable housing. Uh, over the past several months, I've heard from my constituents as well as yours um, about struggling to make the rent in this county, certainly in my part of the county, and I know that it's true for other folks who are living in other parts of our great county. And so today I'm on behalf, I'm here on behalf of my constituents, uh, I'm here on behalf of my neighbors, um, and I'm here on behalf of folks who quite frankly are working right now, whether it's a second job, a third job, or um, uh, or just you know unable to be here physically to testify before you all um, on their struggles. So with that, um, I ask for a favorable report, um, not only because this bill is a good bill and it's the right direction, because, but quite frankly, the rent is too damn high. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, Chair Science. Greetings. Uh, my name is Jeff Science. I am chair of the planning board, at least until this body replaces me, hopefully no later than mid-June. <laughs> Uh, I, I thank the council for uh, for uh, uh, giving us full attendance at our board and the uh, uh, reaffirmation of, of James Hedrick. Uh, I, I really come to uh, council work sessions uh, to uh, make sure I uh, know that I don't have the toughest job in the county. Um, the council does, for sure. A and this is one of those issues that uh, affects everybody in many different ways uh, and and you have an enormous amount of work that's been done on this by your own staff on OLO. They did a study in, in 2020 uh, and they're re going to update that but in 2020 they found that certainly rent stabilization laws lead to supply uh, pressures um, uh, rent controls generally do a poor job of targeting those with the greatest need and often benefiting uh, benefits are inefficiently and Ill, uh, inequitably targeted. Um, the third thing they found is that the largest benefit uh, are to those who don't move and may encourage individuals to rain, remain in units that no longer suit their needs. Um, uh, the, the two bills are in somewhat competitive. You certainly wouldn't uh, uh, adopt uh, uh, this bill and the other bill. Uh, the planning board uh, had a combined uh, sense of, of both of them. But we, we take instruction for, from uh, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, where they adopted a 3% uh, rent 
uh, stabilization bill with with no exemptions for new development, no vacancy deed control. Uh, it resulted in 82 percent less uh, uh, units produced that next year, whereas the neighboring St. Minneapolis uh, had an 80 per 82 percent. I'm sorry. Uh, St. Paul had an 82 percent decrease. Uh, and Minneapolis had a 68% increase in that year. So it is instructive. Uh, the next year, um, St. Paul uh, revoked their, their bill. The, the planning board is sensitive to both, uh, both things. We've, we have in our testimony some specifics, uh, and we hope you will look at them at your pleasure. Thank you, and look forward to working with you. Thank you, Chair Zients. Uh, next is Ms. Pendich. Good afternoon, members of the council. Thank you for having uh, for uh, hearing our testimony. My name is Christine Pendich. I'm a 30-year resident of Tacoma Park, active on anti-poverty and climate issues in the county since 2014. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of a group of county climate and climate justice organizations that work together under the umbrella of the Climate Action Plan (CAP) coalition which supports and monitors implementation of the county's climate action plan. Members of the CAP coalition are deeply concerned about the ongoing effects of climate change, flooding, drought, loss of biodiversity on our community, and seek to address the root causes of it. Because we seek to address the root causes of climate change, the CAP coalition holds climate justice principles at the heart of its agenda. Therefore, many of the members group think uh, groups think it is very important to speak in support of this council's move to address the urgent need for clean, safe, and affordable housing in the county. Rent stabilization is an immediate step towards that important broader goal. The groups signed onto this testimony support the HOME Act, Bill 1623, as the rent stabilization bill most closely aligned with our values of equity and climate justice. In general, we support housing that strives for net zero energy use is public transit oriented and is located in safe, cool, walkable communities. Examining the two bills introduced, we support the Housing Opportunity Mobility and Equity Act as we find it reflects stronger housing justice principles. In particular, we support limiting rent increases to CPU or something close to the 3% cap. A cap of CPU, a CPIU plus 8% is very high. The voluntary rent guideline was last set at 8% in 1983, with much lower increases every year since then. The high level of increase doesn't seem necessary to encourage landlords to rent, and it can be a very big burden on many renters. Landlord maintenance of properties has been an issue in the county. The Home Act sets up a control that requires landlords to be fully compliant with their maintenance responsibilities before a waiver of the cap is allowed. The Home Act imposes an excise tax on units held vacant, thereby prompting fuller use of the available housing stock. We recognize that some compromises between the two bills introduced are likely, and we welcome productive debate on key issues. Uh, we urge that the final bill be made part of a larger package of support for affordable housing. The package must include social support measures such as immediate rent relief when needed, funding public and private to build more affordable and social housing units, more mechanisms for enforcing landlord responsibilities on property maintenance, and even consideration of a living wage. Neither of the two bills currently includes all these features. We urge you to pass additional legislation or enact budget members, uh, measures that build these features into the county's housing framework. For now, for a sustainable future, the CAP Coalition members signed on to this testimony support the Home Act, Bill 1632. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Goldstein. Good afternoon, Mr. President and members of the council. My name is Lily Goldstein. I am a vice president of social impact investing at JBG Smith, a Bethesda-based real estate investment company, where I'm on the Washington Housing Initiative team. Our effort to create and preserve affordable workforce housing for essential workers in Montgomery County and throughout the DC metro region. I am here today to testify in opposition of Bill 1623. I believe that rent control is a misguided policy that will ultimately harm our community. It may seem like a solution to rising rents, but in reality it will have negative effects on both the housing market and residents as it compounds housing affordability issues. 
Rent control by limiting the rent housing providers can charge their tenants results in disincentivizing landlords to invest in their properties, leading to a decline in the quality of housing. As an affordable housing investor, the WHI team focuses primarily on investments in naturally occurring affordable housing properties. These are usually Class B and C assets, which due to their vintage are typically the most expensive assets to operate. By imposing rent control on buildings primarily catering to low and middle income workers, while not providing any relief for rising operating expenses such as utilities, taxes, and payroll, housing providers will simply have to forego routine maintenance and capital investments, leading to a potential disaster and undermining our shared goal of safe, quality, affordable housing. Additionally, with a cap on rent, housing providers may be discouraged from remaining or even entering the market, leading to a decrease of housing supply, as was noted in a recent study conducted by the National Multifamily Housing Council. The fundamental reason housing is expensive is a result of the basic economic principles of supply and demand. If supply is limited, prices increase. This bill further reduces supply as it makes the county a less attractive place in which to invest and create new housing and constrains the quality of the existing inventory. For example, JBG Smith was recently underwriting a building in the county and, as a direct result of this legislation, found that the value of the asset would be reduced by approximately 15%. This legislation would cause rents to grow at a rate slower than expenses, the largest of which have grown at rates well above the average voluntary rental guideline increases, leaving housing providers no option but to invest elsewhere. Providing direct subsidies and financial assistance to residents in need will not only create a true system of quality housing for all, it will allow for the free market to continue to operate and provide tax revenue to support these programs. The legislation as written provides for no means testing to ensure that these residents are th those that are most in need are the ones that benefit. We are deeply committed to our residents' well-being and it is for this reason that I come before you to oppose 1623. We have the same goal in common, to provide quality affordable housing for all Montgomery County residents, but this legislation is likely to do more harm than good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and last on this panel is Ms. Mock. Uh, good afternoon, Council President, Vice President, members of the Council. My name is Kayla Mock. I'm here with United Food and Commercial Workers Union Local 400. We represent over 10,000 members in Maryland in grocery, retail, food processing and packing, health care, law enforcement, and cannabis. Um, we are here today in support of the Housing Opportunity, Mobility, and Equity Act, or the HOME Act, um, which would stabilize rent here in Montgomery County. We hear heartbreaking stories from our members every day, every day, who talk about how they can no longer live in the communities that they serve. They're facing increases. We've heard three, 350, 400, $500 a week or a month in rent increases. For a lot of our members, that's, that's a weekly paycheck. Um, and so with these increases, they're being forced out of the communities that they serve. They're facing longer drive and higher transportation costs because of it, which results in childcare complications, difficulties getting to and from work, um, and many of our members rely on public transportation, which is a whole other problem in and of itself um, when you are facing housing instability. You know, our workers often talk about how sometimes they can't even afford to keep a job because childcare costs and moving out of the community and living further away it's, it, it's too much to get to and from work anymore um, with what they're making. And this is a market, a labor market that is already unstable. And so, you know, our members were frontline and essential workers. They were called heroes during the pandemic. They fed, they served, they cared for, they kept our community safe. They showed up, they got sick, and some of them died because of that. And now they're being forced out because of rent instability and that is completely unfair. They deserve to stay in the communities that they live in, that they serve, and the HOME Act is a way to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Councilmember Jawando has a comment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hold on tight. Yeah. Councilmember <laughs> Jawando has a comment. Uh, thank you all for your testimony and previous testimony as well. Um, Chair Zients, uh, just a question. You cited the OLO report uh, that's being updated. Were you uh, aware of the OLO uh, racial equity s reports on both of these, on this bill? 
I, I'm only aware that they're going to redo the study they did in 2020. But no, no problem. It came out a couple of days ago, but it said on 1623 that it would have a large to moderate, moderate to large impact on racial equity and social justice. Mm -hmm. This bill, 1623. Uh, also, isn't it correct that St. Paul did not, you stated that they did not have exemptions for uh, new, construction. new construction? Yes, okay. they, they uh, didn't have an exemption for that or for uh, a vacancy decontrol either. Right, and this bill does, so that would make it different, so in the, correct? Yes, we, I mean, we have uh, specific recommendations on the specifics on uh, duration of new construction uh, we suggest 15 years. We suggest not having, uh, well, decontrolling upon vacancy um, and, and other suggestions. Got it. But, so but what's the position specific. of the planning board? Is there a position, official position of the yes, planning board? It's, and it's in your pack. Okay. And, but I'm just asking you to speak to it for the folks. Well, yeah. I, I just uh, told you, you what you made those recommendations? Yes. So Council Member Jawanda, he provided his testimony. It's also written. so. I'm not sure there's a need to state it a second or third time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Okay, uh, next panel I'd like to bring up is Marie Nadeep, Mary Avila, Amy Millar, and Yvonne Baker. Ms. Nadip, uh, turn your microphone on. Yes. There you go. Dear council member, good afternoon. My name is Marie Deep. I'm 65 year, 67 years old. I'm writing to express my support for the Home Act. I'm currently facing a big problem, and I have been informed that I have to leave my current home by April 18. Renew my lease at 4% rent increase for 12 months or be automatically placed on a month-to-month -month lease at an 8% rent increase. I'm feeling very hopeless and angry as finding a new affordable home in Montgomery County is proving to be extremely difficult. I went to our social service office I was given a form to fill out of for section 8000, but I have no idea how to fill it. The front desk person told me that it's about, it will be three years to be approved for section 8 housing. This has made my blood pressure high rise. I'm feeling very frustrated with the process. Being alone in this country is already difficult. But facing the possibility of homeless is adding a great deal of stress to my life. I've been searching for a, a second job, but it has been difficult. I work with disabled adults in a group home with Jewish Foundation. Now they reduce our hours, they employ many people, that's why I'm going through a lot. Even a way to find a roommate the cost of rent and utility is becoming increasingly unaffordable. The rent, my rent is currently 1534 a month, and my rent will increase by 8% to $1657 because I'm not longer able to afford a 12-month lease even at 4% in the meantime. Why I look for a new home, I must take month-to-month -month option. This is making increasingly difficult for me to make ends meet, as I'm already having overdraft in my bank account. I pay all my money to rent. I'm pleading with you to support 
and quicken passage of the Home Act and to consider a rent stabilization of 3% or lower. I believe that this will make a harsh difference for people like we, I mean we do, who are struggling to make ends meet. I appreciate your time and appreciation. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Ms. Avila. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Marjorie Ávila. Soy de Honduras y residente de Witton en el distrito 6. También soy miembro de casa de toda la vida. Muchos de ustedes escucharon mi historia que la concejal Christine Mick eh, elogió durante la audiencia de presentación del proyecto de ley. Good afternoon. My name is Mayuria Avila. I am from Honduras and a resident of Wheaton in District 6. I am also a lifelong council member. Many of you have heard my story that council member Kristen Mink uplifted during the bill introduction hearing. Hace unos meses fui desalojada de mi casa. Mi niña de cinco años jugaba inocentemente en el patio. Sin saber lo que estaba pasando, no hay palabras que puedan describir el sentimiento, aparte de que tenía poco valor como ser humano por primera vez. A few months ago, I was evicted from my home as my five-year-old girl played innocently in the yard, not knowing what was happening. No words can describe the feeling other than that I had little value as a human being for the first time. Me atrasé en el alquiler después de un aumento de solo el 6%. I fell behind on rent after an increase of only 6%. Como inquilino que ha experimentado por primera, por primera mano los desafíos de encontrar una vivienda asequible, le, ins le insto a que apoye la ley de viviendas. Este problema es fundamental para los miembros inmigrantes de casa y las familias de bajos ingresos como la mía que suelen ser las más vulnerables a la inseguridad de la vivienda. As a tenant who has experienced firsthand the challenges of finding affordable housing, I urge you to support the HOME Act. This issue is a critical for immigrant CASA members and low-income families like mine, who are often the most vulnerable to housing insecurity. Los precios de alquiler excesivos a la gentrificación han empujado a las familias como la mía fuera de nuestros hogares y comunidades durante demasiado tiempo. Como resultado, muchos de nosotros nos vemos obligados a tomar decisiones difíciles entre pagar el alquiler, poner comida en la mesa u otras necesidades. Esta inestabilidad solo exacerba las desigualdades sistémicas y ejerce más presión sobre los hogares ya sobrecargados. Excessive rent prices and gentrification have pushed families like mine out for homes and communities for too long. As a result, many of us are forced to make difficult choices between paying rent, putting food on the table, or other necessities. This instability only exacerbates sorry, uh, systemic inequalities and puts more pressure on already overburdened households. Al establecer límites significativos y razonables en los aumentos de alquiler, podemos garantizar que las familias como la mía tengan la seguridad y estabilidad que necesitamos para prosperar. Además, al crear aumentos de alquiler predecibles y transparentes, los propietarios pueden mantener la rentabilidad y brindar viviendas de calidad sin sobrecargar a los inquilinos. By setting meaningful and reasonable limits on rent increases, we can ensure that families like mine have the security and stability we need to thrive. Additionally, by creating predictability and transparent rent increases, landlords can maintain profitability and provide quality housing without burning any tenants. Por lo tanto, yo junto con cientos de miembros de casa que residen aquí en el condado de Montgomery, solicito su apoyo incondicional para la ley HOME Proyecto de Ley 1623. Therefore, I, along with hundreds of CASA members, 
who reside here in Montgomery County, request your wholehearted support for the HOME Act, Bill 1623. Hacerlo puede ayudar a crear un mercado inmobiliario más justo y equitativo que beneficie a todos los miembros de la comunidad. Gracias. Doing so can help create a more just and equitable housing market that benefits all community members. I thank you for your time. Gracias. Thank you very much. Ms. Millar. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council President Glass, uh, Council Vice President Friedson, and members of the County Council. Uh, for the record, my name is Amy Millar, and on behalf of uh, the over 8,000 members of UFCW Local 1994, McGeo, I urge you to pass Bill 1623, the Home Act, to stabilize rents in Montgomery County. Uh, our members are nurses, bus drivers, 911 dispatchers, librarians, and more. They keep our county running and help to make it a great place to raise a family. But despite good union jobs, many of them, a growing number, cannot afford to live in the county that they serve. Every year, more and more of our members are forced to move to Frederick County, uh, Prince George's County, which recently passed a rent stabilization bill, or even further afield. Um, those that remain are seeing their spending power uh, eroded by increases in rent and wonder how long they can hold on. Um, this is a work workforce, a Montgomery County government workforce issue as well. Uh, we have growing numbers of vacancies in critical positions in Montgomery County, over 60 uh, vacancies uh, in ECC, those are the uh, 911 dispatchers. Uh, just as one example, corrections, uh, nurses, I can go on and on. And trust me, affordability is a key factor when folks are deciding where they want to work and whether they are going to be making increasingly longer and longer commutes to find affordable housing. Um, inflation and interest rates have made uh, rent stabilization even more important. Uh, even if rate, wage growth throughout the area keeps pace with inflation, there's no cap on rent increases to allow renters to uh, uh, get ahead. I have, there's one member here, I don't want to put her on the spot, but Ronnie, if you want to wave high, who just saw an increase in 20% uh, of her, uh, on her rent. And I just want to say that beyond that 20%, she was already uh, at the peak of, of what, what she could afford. So even seeing an increase of six, five, six, seven, eight percent would have forced her to move. But these increasing rates are, are really uh, sending our, our members outside of the county. Um, this bill's critical, nearly 40% as we've heard of uh, county residents are renters. And with the average rent over $2,000, 23% of county residents are paying more than half their incomes and in rents. Uh, this bill will stabilize these increases and give our members and the residents that we serve the predict predictability that they need. Uh, given that Prince George's County, as I said, just passed a rent stabilization me measure, capping rent increases at 3%, we think the HOME Act is a reasonable approach to studying uh, Montgomery County rents. And we urge the council to pass the HOME Act. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Baker. Good afternoon, council members and council president Glass. My name is Yvonne Baker and I'm the Vice President of Asset Management at the Donahoe Companies, a Montgomery County based company. The Donahoe Companies was founded in 1884 and is one of the region's oldest full service real estate companies. We have developed over 10 million square foot of space in the DC metro area during the last six decades, including 453 units of housing in Montgomery County. We have evaluated the proposed legislation and found that Bill 1623 will be detrimental to new housing supply in Montgomery County. Should Bill 1623 pass and establish rent stabilization policies, major equity investors and developers will have little incentive to create new housing in the county. Investors rely on rental income as the single source of revenue to cover operating expenses and major capital improvements at the properties. We are already experiencing headwinds from rising operating expenses in addition to increased labor costs resulting from labor so shortages and inflation. 
With limitations to potential rental re revenue, the passage of Bill 1623 will make it extremely difficult for owners to operate residential properties efficiently and safely across the county, as well as discourage further investment and deployment of capital in the area. Rent stabilization measures at any level will severely limit the willingness of investors on both the equity and debt sides to commit capital to our projects. During underwriting of a new development, you examine varying levels of rent growth and determine both the risk and value of the investment. In the event the county sets a limit on rent increases, the risk profile is thereby significantly exacerbated. Such measures will eliminate the best case investment scenario because risks will far outweigh rewards due to capped rental revenue. The likely alternative from an investor standpoint would be to invest in a jurisdiction other than Montgomery County, which is already in critical need of increased housing supply. Currently, Donahoe has, proposed, has a proposed development in Montgomery County, which is slated to be a 300 unit apartment project of which 15% would be designated affordable housing units. So this development alone would add approximately 45 affordable units to the county's inventory. We own an additional three sites that are slated for a residential conversion, which would add 500 more units to the inventory. However, county imposed rent stabilization will hinder our ability to secure financing and investors for this property because of the heightened risk profile. We are deeply concerned that this could prevent us from moving forward at all. We must recognize that the county's ongoing housing supply limitations will be jeopardized by rent control measures that reduce the profitability of rental housing and thus encourage sources of investment capital to explore jurisdictions outside of Montgomery County that produces reasonable rates of return. As such, I ask for your opposition to Bill 1623 and instead urge the council to work toward a more equitable approach for all involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. Next, I'd like to invite Bert Bayou, Chris Perry, Larry Edmonds, and Eric Gentoff. Very good. Mr. Bayou, we'll start with you. You have three minutes. Thank you, Council President and Council Members. <clears throat> My name is Bert Bayou. I'm the uh, Director of African Communities Together for the DC Area Chapter. Uh, African Communities Together is an organization of immigrants from Africa and their families. Uh, African Communities Together, or ACT, empower African immigrants to integrate socially, get ahead economically, and engage civically. We connect African immigrants to critical services and help Africans develop as leaders and organize our communities on the issues that matter. So, uh, for our chapter here in the D.C. area, uh, addressing the threat of displacement of low-income African immigrants is a top priority. Um, <clears throat> from the beginning, uh, we have built a, a base of tens of thousands of African immigrant contacts and connected thousands of African immigrants to direct services and engaging them to be more leaders and engaging um, you know, in their leadership development and public actions. Uh, but Every time we do surveys and uh, all the discussions that we have always comes back to our uh, community members telling us that their housing burden and housing and rent increase is a big issue for them uh, that they cannot carry. Uh, Montgomery County is home to tens of thousands of uh, African immigrants and most of our community members are low-wage workers and they are renters. Uh, most of our co uh, 
community members uh, they work in the stores uh, they drive uber taxis and lift they uh, work in uh, uh, home care and all uh, all kind of jobs that are low wage and very impossible uh, to move forward with the kind of rent increases that we are seeing in the in the county so a typical African immigrant household spends uh, almost half of their income on rent already and most of the times uh, renters must work two or sometimes even three jobs to make ends meet so immigrant communities cannot afford or accept increases larger than three percent if they want to stay in this county bill 1623 protects our community from economic stress and displacement like it it has happened to them in washington dc a few years ago so we urge this council to support the home act and reject bill 1523 as it would make it uh, uh, make it a law for landlords to make double digit rent increases thank you thank you Mr. Perry. Good afternoon, uh, Council President Glass, Council Vice President Friedson, members of the Council. My name is James Perry. My wife, Kathy, and I moved to Silver Spring in 2009 to be close to her family. I speak in support of Bill 1623. I'm a Vietnam War veteran, and I've taught English to people who don't speak English as their native language. During the pandemic, I helped Maryland and Montgomery County Public Health Authorities identify early victims of COVID-19 for treatment and assistance. My wife has tutored elementary school students in local schools, and she volunteers in a senior citizen's choir. In 2013, I retired from half a century's work as an IT consultant. Kathy and I have been living in Silver Spring on a fixed income, Social Security and pensions ever since. In a few weeks, I may have to find another apartment to live in. My landlord has indicated she will raise our monthly rent, but won't tell me what the percentage increase will be. I've heard of others in my building who have received 5 to 10% hikes. If we receive that much, we'll have to move. If so, my wife and I will be forced to leave her son and his family, our friends, and people in my wife, the, my wife and I volunteer with. This afternoon, I'm asking you to support Councilmember Jawando's bill that would stabilize our family's monthly expenditure for housing. We currently pay more than 25% of our take-home pay in rent. With current inflation, we expect also to pay more for food and medical care. Even with cost of living increases from Social Security, I don't think we can handle 30% and more going to our landlord. Unless Council helps us deal with our dwindling financial situation, we're going to have to leave our current dwelling and possibly Montgomery County and Maryland altogether. Please help us to continue to age in place where we can continue to give back to our community and neighbors. I ask you to pass Bill 1623. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Perry. <laughs> Mr. Edmonds. Thank you, President Glass, esteemed members of the Council. Uh, for the last two and a half decades since I've been a member in Montgomery County, I have fought for education, the students here, the elderly, the disabled, and many other members in, in the society in Montgomery County. And I think I met a lot of you through those, through those efforts. Um, I am also here representing the 200 industry members for AOBA, who are the plumbers, the electrical engineers. Uh, we have various methods that they have from supply goods, suppliers, steel workers, construction, uh, and various other workers that work for these organizations. Uh, about 20,000 local employees. We have about 100,000 family members involved as well. And when I look at the county, I'm saying to myself, you know, we have a lot of things that go on, but I hate to see we have a county where it's not able to do free enterprise. We're not able to be a capitalist county and do things in our county that other counties are doing around the area. Uh, we have lost a lot, I think, of virtue and uh, um, income to other counties in the uh, state and in Virginia. Uh, we also understand that to do things, because I'm listening to all the stories I heard up here, and a lot of things are emotional. So I feel these things. I feel when somebody's rent is too high. I feel when somebody is about to be evicted and can't afford to stay in the residence they are in. You know, but I also know 
by being a business person that there's no way we're going to be able to continue to help our citizens without the income that comes in from our local businesses and our business owners and our industries that we do business with in our county. One of them, of course, is the property management industry. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be on both sides of the table, so I've, I know what it is to be an advocate for our citizens, but I also understand that I've sat at the table with board members from CEOs, executives, and most of the big players that are in Montgomery County, you know, in management and property management. And you know what I've never heard them say not one time that I've sat in that room. I've never heard them talk about evicting citizens. I've never heard them talk about making their property unsafe or not doing the right thing in their buildings. In fact, I've heard completely opposite of that. I've heard things that they're trying to figure out ways that they can have more income to make the properties even a better place to live. They consider these folks their residents, their their guests. A lot of them consider their place, call their places homes. They don't even call them apartments. So, you know, I don't think we should alienate a industry as a whole. We, if there is bad actors, let's go after the bad actors. You know, somebody's charging somebody 20% additional rent, let's go after that person and not the industry as a whole. So. I'm against any bill that stops us from being a free enterprise county and being able to bring more business to our county so that we can help our citizens even better in the long term. So that's where I stand, and I appreciate you allowing me to have this time to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and last speaker on this panel, Mr. Gentoff. Yep. Thank you, council members and uh, council president uh, Glass. So I'm here speaking on behalf of a lot of our clients. Uh, I'm with the Zupanza Group of Marcus and Millichap. So we sell multifamily properties throughout D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, typically Class B and C workforce housing, and we've done over 300 deals in the area. So we're very familiar with the policies. And I think, you know, one thing that everybody in this room can get behind is that we have an affordable housing issue, and we're all here trying to find a way to solve it. So we need to make sure that we're not getting divisive and saying it's us versus them, it's landlords versus tenants. At the end of the day, it's a problem that has root causes and a housing shortage, which is, has been exacerbated by issues with zoning and issues with incentivizing developers to actually build affordable housing. So at the end of the day, we live in a market-based economy, and it's not the council's job to decide where rents should be or where people should be able to charge rents. That's what the market is for. The council's job is to incentivize developers to build affordable housing, to provide subsidies, so expanding programs like LIHTC, low-income housing tax credits that are needs-based, expanding the voucher program, figuring out ways to increase wages and remove some of the burden from some of these hard-working people that we've heard from throughout this hearing. And, I mean, the reality is there's not much that economists agree on. That being said, rent control being ineffective is one of the few things everybody does agree on. It, as a lot of people have said, I mean, it's not needs blind. It does not target the lowest income people who need it. It provides poor building conditions over time as landlords can't, aren't incentivized to actually per, to put in the money to make the properties operate the way that they should be, causes a lack of mobility, and ultimately uh, decreases the levels of development. And when we're sitting here talking about these massive rent increases that people have been facing, I mean, part of it is anecdotal. I mean, rents have gone up. The average rent increase over the last 15 years in Montgomery County and throughout suburban Maryland has been 3.1%. So at the face of it, it's an unnecessary bill. We're seeing these huge rent increases for two main reasons. Number one, the fact that there was a rent freeze that didn't expire until May of 2022. Landlords' expenses went up during that time and the fear of rent control has also pushed people to increase rents beyond where they typically would because they know that something is coming. And so when we're looking at what the stabilized market is, it's much different than the stories that we're hearing right now. It will absolutely disincentivize investors. It will move, cause people to leave the county and move to places like Virginia. We're hearing this on the ground day in and day out. And last point, I mean, we're talking about the fair returns. There's nothing fair about the returns. They don't in include debt, and debt is at the forefront of commercial real estate. The interest rate environment has gotten significantly worse, and that is not reflected in any of the legislation that we're seeing today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. Uh, we have one final individual providing testimony. 
and Philip Jones is virtual. I see you, Mr. Jones. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for allowing us all to speak. And I think that these bills are starting place, but they are not the answer. Um, we need to be a little bit more sophisticated, maybe a lot more sophisticated in how we address these problems that are being brought to us. Um, my background is 40 years in affordable housing. I was a program director for Community Action Agency. I founded Affordable Housing Solutions. Um, I have founded, helped found other nonprofit uh, groups to develop affordable housing. I've been a consultant to the um, Department of Housing and Urban Development on the tax credit program, the home program, and almost every affordable housing program they've initiated in the last 30 years. And there's no question that just rent control is not effective in producing affordable housing. What it produces is cheating, people not moving, uh, it ends up benefiting the clever and the capable who can weasel their way into an affordable unit and stay there. Um, and that's unfortunate. I mean, I agree that we need to create affordable housing, but I want to support the other uh, folks who spoke about building a stronger nonprofit housing development network. Where we look at affordable housing being uh, adequate are places like Vermont, Burlington, Vermont is a sterling example of a place that said, hey, all developers have to create a certain percentage of affordable units. These are going to be needs-based. All affordable units are needs-based. And that's monitored through, uh, through the nonprofit organizations that run these units or the advocacy, advocacy groups. It doesn't necessarily all come down to county staff managing it. Um, I would speak against exemptions for new development. New development in prime real estate areas should include affordable housing so that there's a diverse mix of incomes and people. Um, I would speak against any hardcore limit like 3%. As soon as you put something like that in the, in the law, those letters started going out to tenants uh, hey, your rent's going up now because 3% is not realistic when inflation is 7 or 9%. So that scares any investor. Uh, we need to build the supply of affordable housing through other incentives, and we need to make our assistance to low-income people needs-based. The problem of poverty is not just in housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones, for your testimony. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Over the last uh, almost two hours, we heard from 25 of you. This evening, we'll be coming back at 7 o'clock to hear from 60 more residents. Uh, the purpose of these hearings is to hear from all of you about your thoughts and concerns about the two different bills. So uh, follow us online this evening, or we welcome you back to the chamber as well. And with that, this public hearing is now closed. Okay, colleagues, we are now going to turn to a work session on amendments to the FY23 to 28 capital improvements program. Mr. Levchenko, I see, is making his way. No, that's coming. That we, we will do the consent calendar at the end. Okay, I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that.
Okay. CIP. Um, so uh, the T&E committee uh, took up various items recently. I'll quickly recap them and then turn it over to Mr. Lovchenko for anything that was missed. Uh, first, we took up the WSSC Water FY 24 to 29 CIP, and WSSC is seeking $4.5 billion, uh, and the county executive does not recommend any changes to the proposed CIP. Uh, and the committee, TNE committee, recommended support for that CIP, rec uh, recognizing the importance of having a uh, functional sewer and water maintenance system uh, and making sure we uh, we deliver on, on those simple priorities. Um, Mr. Lovchenko, do you want to expand upon that or would you prefer if we go through all T&E, all three items? or? Well, we do have folks from WSC Water here. We do. Uh, if you want to hear from them. I didn't know if Ms. Powell was, was here at the moment or not. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right in front of me. This is um, our first time before the full council, yes. right? So it's okay. So if, if you right. like if, to... if you want to introduce yourself to the to the entire council, uh, right in front of you. Here. Yep, there you go. All right. Good good afternoon and thank you. Uh, good afternoon, President Glass, Vice President Friedson, and distinguished council members. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here before you today for my... Uh, for my first meeting before you. Uh, I'm WSSC Water General Manager and CEO Keisha Powell. Uh, with me today I have, have our acting CFO Letitia Carolina Powell, uh, Deputy General Manager of Administration Joe Beach, and Brian Holleran, our Capital Budget Section Manager. I also want to take a moment to recognize our commissioners. Uh, Chair Bayonet is here, as well as Commissioner Foster, and I also want to recognize uh, Commissioner Dennis. Uh, as well as our team that are here with us this afternoon and those not in attendance that have worked diligently to prepare the budget and prioritize our priorities, as I say. And our dedicated and talented WSSC water workforce, many who work to maintain the very assets we are investing in. It's a pleasure to be here with you to brief you on our fiscal year 2024 2029 to 2029 capital improvements program. And as I did back in February when we briefed the T&E committee on the six year improvement plan, I'd also like to recognize and thank uh, Mr. Uh, Levchenko for his knowledge and collaboration throughout the budget process. I know we are crunched for time, so I will keep my opening remarks brief. But I wanted to start by sharing a reflection from a discussion that I had last week while attending the United Nations Water Conference in New York City, where delegations from around the globe convened to talk about water for the first time in a generation. As the discussion ensued, we touched on several topics surrounding the need to develop an actionable agenda to address the most pressing issues impacting our ability as a global water sector to provide water security for all the communities we serve. To share a few statistics from the UN Vision Statement, a quarter of the global population, which is two billion people, use unsafe drinking water sources. Half of humanity, 3.6 billion people, live without safely managed sanitation. Over 80% of wastewater is released to the environment without being treated or reused. Now to bring it home, it occurred to me during that discussion that WSSC Water through its continued investments in our infrastructure, our operations, and our people are ensuring that 100% of the effluent from our water resource recovery facilities is treated to a high standard. We are ensuring that the communities in our service area do not have to live without safely managed sanitation. And for 105 years, WSSC Water has ensured that our communities do not have to worry about drinking unsafe water due to an amazing track record of zero drinking water quality violations in the history of the commission. And we are committed to continuing this exceptional level of excellence. Even in light of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's announcement last week 
that they're proposing new drinking water regulations on six PFAS compounds, which are often referred to as the forever chemicals. Um, if treatment processes are necessary to deal with and meet those new regulations, rest assured we will make, make them, but that will come at a significant capital expense and ongoing operations and maintenance costs. It's too soon for us to tell at this point if there will need to be changes. Uh, we are uh, evaluating the proposed regulations and we'll keep you updated on that evaluation. But while increased costs due to the new regulation is on the horizon, we're now facing very real impacts to our operating and capital budgets. Um, to name a few that are impacting our capital budget, we've seen paving increase as much as 53%, construction costs have increased 6%, and our six-year capital costs for our share to DC Water for our regional sewage payment have increased 38.4 million over the six years. Bottom line, the current economic climate, supply chain disruptions, and inflationary pressures impacting all Americans are impacting our budget as well. And at the same time, we're still experiencing lower revenue due to decreasing water consumption. Approximately 80,000 customer accounts are past due, totaling more than $56 million in arrears. So these challenges make our proposed 7% rate increase vital to our capital program, which fulfills our mission to provide safe, clean, and reliable water to your constituents, our customers. The funding generated by these adjusted rates allows us to ensure that WSSC Water can continue its stellar track record of providing safe drinking water and being a good steward of the environment by getting in front of regulatory challenges like PFAS and investing ahead of changes in regulation. Where operational reliability and resilience is concerned, the CIP is our biggest lever to ensuring that we provide services reliably and when we have interruption that we can recover quickly and continue critical functions to supply water. Thank you again for this opportunity and with that I'll turn it over to Mr. Levshenko. Well, Jim Foster, I just want to say uh, thank you. Uh, you've now shared with the the full council the reason why the T and E committee was impressed with you when we met with you and uh, Chair Bayonet. Nice to see you and Commissioner Foster as well. Thank you for being here, uh, Mr. Olchenko. We'll turn it back to you. Yeah, just in the interest of time, I I, I don't think we are going to be going through every project today. No, I see your head nodding. Um, but I did want to just. Uh, note a few things um, I, I think important to, to this new council especially. Uh, first, um, with the CIP reviews that started last week and, and also you're, you've done today and, and uh, after this, um, right now the council's not taking final action, just discussion and, and straw vote. Um, uh, uh, in particular with, with the WSSC water uh, budget, we have a unique process there. Uh, the operating budget will be coming up uh, later this spring. Uh, and then we have a bi-county meeting in May where the two councils agree on both the operating and the, and the uh, operating budget and capital improvements programs. Also, um, unlike the other departments and agencies, WSSC Water is a full CIP this year. So every year we go through the full CIP. It's not an off year like it is with the others. It may not seem like an off year uh, sometimes, but it is this year for uh, the rest of the budgets. Um, and uh, also unique to WSSC Water, uh, they have their own unique spending affordability process. Uh, so they're not part of the uh, CIP spending affordability where we deal with general obligation bonds and current revenue uh, and the impacts on the operating budget and so forth. Uh, they have their own affordability process that the both councils go through in the fall of each year. Um, and so that is a particularly critical process. Uh, um, uh, Ms. Powell mentioned the 7% rate increase and that, that rate increase is consistent with uh, the spending affordability guidelines that both councils supported last fall. That does not bind the councils going forward, but it is an important marker uh, and helps uh, WSSC Water build its budget going forward. Uh, so that, that process is, is uh, critical to all of this. Um, uh, and uh, so I think first, uh, unlike the, many of the other budgets you will hear about uh, uh, or have heard about today and, and in the next few weeks, um, they don't compete directly 
uh, with a lot of the other projects that you hear about with regard to general obligation bonds, it, it's very important to, um, to understand that. And also, the fiscal challenges that, that you heard a little bit about as well are also unique to WSSC Water. Um, they have high levels of debt service uh, that are um, uh, we carefully watch as part of the operating budget. That debt service is coming from all the CIP work uh, that has ramped up substantially over the last 10 to 15 years uh, to get ahead or catch up, in many cases, to a lot of their aging infrastructure. Uh, so that's a, a, a major theme that, that we've seen over the last decade, and, and it, it does hit in the operating budget in terms of debt. Uh, and one of the major uh, issues they deal with on the operating side is trying to maintain that debt at a reasonable level. Uh, for both their budget, but also for the debt rating agencies. Um, uh, I mentioned aging infrastructure. At the same time, water consumption has been flat, uh, even with uh, increased uh, population over the last 20 years. Per capita usage is down. That's their major or dominant uh, revenue source. Um, so once again, that complicates issues on the operating budget and ultimately means uh, uh, challenges on the, on the capital side as well. Um, so I think those challenges are important to understand in context. Uh, with regard to the CIP, um, uh, I'll mention just a few quick points about it and then and see if you have uh, if there's any questions. Um, uh, the council president mentioned the 4.5 billion dollar uh, 4.5 billion dollar CIP. Uh, it's an increase of about 334 million dollars from the approved CIP from last year, about eight percent. Um, you've heard some of the reasons for that increase. Um, uh, inflation is, is still running higher uh, than typical. You heard the 6% number. It's typically been closer to about 4%. Um, they are still facing supply chain issues uh, with projects and um, uh, also with recent bid experience, cost increases in projects that are reflected here. Uh, also, they are um, catching up to some work that was delayed the last few years for fiscal reasons, for some of the reasons I mentioned before. Uh, to help on the operating side uh, with debt, uh, to try to keep debt uh, manageable. So some of those costs uh, were deferred. Um, they still have to happen. Uh, you, they're, they're not really cuts, they're deferrals, and those deferrals right. have to come back at some point. Right. So we're seeing that in this, in this budget as well. Uh, so a, a lot of that is contributing to it. You also heard about the Blue Plains wastewater treatment plant costs, which are uh, costs based on the intermissible agreement that uh, WCC Water is a part of. Uh, so in the short run, at least, those costs are pretty much out of our control. They are um, formula-driven costs. Uh, we do have representation on DC Water, which um, uh, manages the, uh, um, ultimately approves the budgets um, that build into that. But in the short run, at least, we have the bill that we have to pay. Um, um, other than that, I'll just mention there are several uh, large increases in some of the uh, infrastructure projects that uh, are the biggest and most important to WSSC Water, including their, um, their uh, water uh, reconstruction program and their sewer reconstruction program have some significant increases. Um, the uh, trunk sewer reconstruction program as well. Um, they have two consent decree projects. Uh, moving forward, including at the Potomac uh, Water Filtration Plant, as well as their ongoing uh, sanitary sewer overflow consent decree program, which is actually winding down within the six years, uh, but still has several hundred million dollars in it. That's about a $1.5 billion effort over the past decade. Um, the Piscataway Bioenergy Project is the largest WCC Water CIP project with a beginning and an end. Uh, that's about a $335 million project uh, that would um, uh, serve to um, provide a, a source for all of our biosolids uh, generated at our wastewater treatment plants to be treated and become a class A biosolids while also generating clean energy through that process. Uh, so that project is moving forward. Although once again, uh, supply chain issues with projects like that uh, can be a significant impediment. Um, another project which we will be revisiting, the I-495, I-270 traffic relief plan pipeline relocations. Given the uncertain status of that project, uh, we'll need to revisit that issue with WSSC Water. No ratepayer um, funded um, expenditures is associated with that project. It is assumed to come from outside sources of funding related to the concessionaire. Uh, but 
as it is, that project will have to be revisited as well to when we have a sense of what's happening um, with that. Right. Um, with that, I'll, I'll stop and let uh, uh, see if there are any questions. Um, uh, Council uh, Vice President Friedson has a comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Chair. I uh, really appreciate all of the uh, T&E Committee's work on this. Thank you to WSSC and, and welcome. Uh, good to see you, Chair Fausto and, uh, and Commissioner Foster. Nice to see you uh, as well. Um, I had uh, really wanted to ask about um, the Water Storage Facility Rehabilitation uh, Program. I was hoping that WSSC staff could advise on efforts to uh, advance projects in that program, the typical scope of those projects, and how often WSSC conducts, conducts the work uh, on those uh, facilities. I ask because I have been contacted quite a lot from uh, a group of residents whose homes are directly adjacent to the Bradley Hills standpipes one and two. The standpipes are more or less in their backyard, so certainly impacts them significantly. Uh, the residents have ongoing concerns about the deteriorating conditions of the standpipes. They're worried about the safety due to rusty flaking paint, and they're concerned about the impact uh, on their properties. Uh, a, a recent appraisal of uh, one of the properties noted the condition of the standpipes specifically in the appraisal, uh, and, and specifically noted it as a negative factor that directly impacted their property value. Uh, the residents more broadly were recently told uh, in 2018 that the rehabilitation of the Bradley Hill standpipes would be completed within five years. It's now five years, and I'm not aware of any advancement moving towards that effort, and I think the latest schedule shows that it will be quite a long time before anything moves forward on that, so I was just hoping if I could get a response uh, to what the status is on that and how these issues are generally handled. So the water storage facility rehabilitation program is an ongoing program that has many tanks included in it. At this time it has about nine tanks in the program. <clears throat> um, the cost estimates for the program have gone up and down over the last several years in part due to fiscal constraints. At times it has been pulled back due to fiscal conditions and work has been deferred out into the future. Uh, the Bradley Hills 1 and 2 standpipes, the current schedule for those has the planning work in fiscal years 27 to 29, the design of in 20, fiscal years 27 through 30 and construction in fiscal years 29 through 32. Um, so the work that goes into these tanks varies depending on the specific tank that we're looking at. So we go out and we do condition assessment looking at the structural elements of the tank, the electrical elements of the tank, the mechanical elements of the tank. Uh, so it can uh, require repainting the tanks, replacing pumps, replacing electrical equipment, uh, replacing structural elements of the tank to make sure that they're sturdy and that they can continue to last. Yeah, I mean, you can understand the concern here. It's not just about a standpipe and the increased costs that are happening. You're asking for a substantial increase, 8%. And residents were told something was going to take five years without being notified that it's going to be closer to at least 10 or 15, maybe 20 years, it sounds like. Um, they have not been notified of any changes as recently as earlier today a resident reached out to ask and no information was given. I think it was updates will be provided as more information becomes available. This is blocking and tackling. I mean this is the, the basic element of a public entity in its interaction with residents who are paying for its services and I just I have to express deep concerns if this is the type of expectations that we set with residents, the type of communication that we have. It's very difficult for residents to trust that we can get these huge projects that they're paying significant amounts of money as ratepayers to fund, that we can get those done and we can get them done right if we can't get these little things right. like. When are we going to paint a standpipe? You know, when are we going to replace 
uh, as part of the basic maintenance. Please. Uh, thank you, Vice President Friedson, for your uh, feedback. I wasn't aware of the inquiry, but I'll look into it uh, when I get back to the office. Um, we are starting um, an assessment of the capital program for planning for this next year, uh, and we'll be making changes to um, our plan and making sure that we're evaluating the projects um, that are there and what needs to move forward and when and if we need to pull things forward. As we said in the T&E the, uh, meeting before, um, we will look to do that and we'll communicate, uh, we'll have that discussion with our commissioners. Um, the Anything that is a safety issue, we want to make sure that we're moving forward on that. Uh, just earlier today, I had a discussion with the team uh, about a process that we'll be uh, implementing for Project Stat to really assess or track um, the delivery of our capital improvement program for these very reasons. Um, we want to make sure that if we commit to um, delivering a project that we are um, on track with those commitments and that the projects are delivering on time. Um, I just confer with our Deputy General Manager of Operations. He doesn't have specific information on that project, but I'd be happy to follow up with your office uh, today with more information on that project. Appreciate that on this particular issue, and I think that would be very helpful. Uh, the broader issue remains, and I hope you will dig mm -hmm. as deeply into that when we tell residents something's going to take five years. If it's not going to take five years, we need to communicate that with them. If we say it's going to be five years, we need to hold ourselves accountable to that. I, I understand that your core mission is to provide healthy and safe water to residents, to provide core infrastructure to residents, but it's also important every interaction that we have with residents, even on the less existential aspects of your responsibilities, that we take those responsibilities just as seriously because it's all part of the public trust that you have as a public entity and that we have as public officials. And so I appreciate you looking into that. I, I hope that we can uh, do better moving forward and uh, appreciate your commitment to doing so. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for uh, listening to the district council member, uh, and I know that you will, you and your team, and Mr. Beach uh, will work with him uh, to make sure that the residents um, uh, have what they need. Thank um, you. Um, not seeing any other comments from my colleagues, I think we're good with this WSSC budget. So thank you all, um, and again, uh, welcome, Ms. Foster. We look forward to seeing your return to to Rockville. Uh, next item uh, within the TNE portfolio is the conservation of natural resources storm water drains. Uh, and the, uh, do you know comment? Okay. Um, uh, this is an approved FY23 20 to 28 CIP for $36.2 million. Um, and the committee. Uh, accepted the executive's recommendations with regard to revisions to outfall repairs and storm drain culvert replacements. And Keith, I'll turn it over to you for any additional details. Yeah, these were technical adjustments, funding switches, uh, reflecting uh, that long-term financing from the state that had been assumed in these projects um, is not going to happen because of the scope of the projects not fitting with uh, what the uh, long-term financing ultimately will pay for. Uh, so the, the funding is, mo is moving from that back to Water Quality Protection Fund bonds. Uh, so it's still financed, uh, but under a di different mechanism. But no change in scope, cost, or timing to any of these projects. So staff had recommended approval, as did the, the committee unanimously. And not seeing any other comments, uh, we'll approve without objection then. Okay. Uh, and another item, conservation of natural resources, storm water management. Uh, this is a CIP for $119.4 million. Regarding the executive's 
recommended amendments to the stormwater facility major structural repair project and other ongoing stormwater management projects. Yeah, in this project, there, in this program, there was one amendment that came over in the January 17th package uh, related to cost increases for the stormwater facility major structural repair project, an additional $2.8 million um, to address cost increases for the Lake Hollowell dredging project, as well as the railroad branch dam emergency work. Um, staff had supported approval of, of the uh, executive's amendment, as had the committee. Um, uh, other than that, there were just technical adjustments. Um, there was one other amendment that's come over subsequently in March, the March 15th uh, package of amendments uh, related to the um, uh, flood control project in the CIP, uh, but we'll be taking that up uh, later uh, in the T&E committee before bringing that back to the council. Very good. There are a few committee work sessions and various committees that have to work on the uh, additional recommendations by the county executive, but I'm not seeing any other comments, so we'll support without objection those recommendations. I'm oh, sorry, there's one other project. The, the Wheat okay. Regional Dam Flooding Mitigation Project had also come over uh, in, in the March amendments. Staff had noted that it likely would be delayed because of its linkage to the Dennis Avenue um, Bridge project uh, that was seeing its own delays. Uh, so this project also came over um, with some changes. So we'll, we'll revisit that and bring that back to the committee as well. Very good. Thank you. Next item is the Recycling and Resource Management, which is a six-year CIP of $49.5 million, which includes a full upgrade of the existing recycling center complex, uh, and the transfer station fire detection and suppression system, and the T&E committee supported these recommendations as well. Yeah, there were just technical adjustments to the transfer station fire detection suppression system project, uh, recognizing uh, the actual costs slightly below um, what they have been in the project. Uh, but the, the bigger issue is the full upgrade of the existing recycling center complex, which is experiencing substantial cost increases for machinery and equipment, totaling about $7.3 million in an increase. Um, I, as we discussed in the committee, this is a critical project uh, for the uh, for our solid waste system as a whole in terms of increasing the capacity of or throughput of the facility, uh, as well as upgrading the facility um, given its aging equipment. Uh, so the committee had uh, unanimously recommended approval of that uh, cost increase or reflecting that cost increase as, as uh, recommended in the amendment by the county executive. And not seeing any of the comments, we will support without objection. And I think that is it for the environmental aspect of T&E, Mr. Lovchenko. And now we'll turn to the T part of the T&E committee. And these are amendments to the transportation projects. And according to the amendments, I believe transportation spending would be reduced by the original amendments by nearly $89 million. Um, and the T&E committee had a, a very robust discussion um, and ultimately um, made many restorations to these budget cuts, uh, which uh, to these CIP cuts, uh, which included uh, restoring funding for the Capitol Crescent Trail, restoring funding for the completion of Observation Drive, restoring funding for the North Bethesda Metro entrance um, and for other mass transit and traffic improvements. Uh, and that's just the teaser because Dr. Orland will elaborate a little bit more. Well, I will keep this brief. <laughs> um, let's go to page three. Um, there are 11 projects there which are purely ministerial. There are no changes in scope or timing um, and the committee recommends approval of those. Uh, then there are a couple of purple line related projects where the department's having to spend a bit more money, um, mostly because of the extended period of the project itself. They have to spend more money to pay staff to uh, supervise the county's part of the project. Uh, the committee agreed with those. The committee agreed with all the, what I'm going to recommend. Um, on page four, the sidewalk and curb replacement project, the project does what it says. 
Uh, most of the project goes directly for that work, but there have been $500,000 a year historically for contributions from homeowners who take advantage of DOT being in the neighborhood to have their driveway aprons replaced. Uh, that program has really dropped back quite a bit uh, because due to mostly lack of interest from the homeowners uh, because the price that DOT can get now for materials and labor uh, is not that much different than an individual homeowner can have. And so the, um, the only difference from what the committee is recommending compared to the executive, the executive recommends stripping out the $500,000 assumption of contributions for each year. And, uh, but the committee said, well, there may be a few people who still want to take advantage of this, and the department has to have the appropriation authority to actually do those aprons. And without appropriation authority, they can't do anything. So the committee's recommending adding $100,000 to the appropriated uh, uh, the appropriation for FY24. Um, the Dennis Town Bridge replacement, Keith mentioned it just a second ago, uh, in finishing up the design for the project, uh, DOT's encountered some more problems with uh, uh, utility relocation and the design cost. The design has produced a higher cost estimate, so as a result, the project's delayed one year. Uh, again, this is for production reasons, it's not for uh, uh, fiscal reasons. Uh, Burtonsville um, Park and Ride Improvements, there's a state uh, a grant for $4.5 million to design a park and ride uh, facility uh, garage up at the uh, Burtonsville Flash Station. It's also adjacent to the shopping center there, and this is state money, so of course uh, recommending approval of that. Uh, the department's recommending spending $2 million more, this is a new project, to develop a new uh, replacement uh, uh, right on depot. There are three depots. This is the depot at Nicholson Court. Uh, its lease runs out 2027. Uh, it's too small to accommodate growth in the right on system over time and also the electric, uh, the uh, zero emission vehicles and supporting infrastructure. So, what this money would do would be to uh, find a new site and also do a design of the uh, of that project. Ultimately, next year, the year after, they'll be, I'm sure they'll be coming back for money to build it but not now. Um, then we get to the meat of the backpack, and it's starting at page 5. Uh, for the last 17 years, uh, standard procedure for county executives has been to delay a lot of transportation projects or even to delete them in favor of other priorities in the CIP. Um, a couple major uh, road projects are gone. Goshen Road Extended is gone. Uh, Montrose Parkway East is gone. Um, and there are the table on page 5, you'll see nine projects which are um, uh, mostly bikeways, but also a, a transit project and a, road, a couple of road projects, which the have already been, mostly, most of them have been delayed quite a bit already, and the executive is recommending further delays. Um, and the short of it is that the committee is not recommending delaying any of them, uh, but I need to go into detail a little bit more for each of these, just as they know specifically what's going on. Uh, Goldsboro Road uh, si sidewalk and bikeway uh, has been delayed three years to this point. The executive recommends two more years of delay. The committee says no. Um, the Bradley Boulevard improvements uh, has been delayed uh, one year to this point. The executive is recommending another two-year delay. Uh, the committee is saying no to that. Uh, the North Bethesda Metro Station northern entrance, the design is already fully funded for 24 and 25 from a state grant. Uh, the construction wasn't going to start until FY26. Um, but the, um, uh, the, and that's already a, a two-year delay from what had been initially programmed. Uh, the executive recommends a one-year delay, and the committee is saying no to that. Uh, the Falls Road Bikeway and Pedestrian Facility has been delayed 14 years to this point, uh, and the executive is recommending delaying it two more years. The committee is saying no to that. Uh, and there is some design money that uh, was programmed in the last CIP in FY22, which hasn't started yet, so that's now going to show up in FY23 and 24, but it would not affect the current construction start date, which is FY28, the, uh, design and construction, uh, sorry, land acquisition and construction, 27 and 28. Uh, the Tuckerman Lane sidewalk, a little complicated. There are two phases to this. Uh, one is a very short section of uh, uh, sidewalk along Tuckerman Lane near Churchill High School. Uh, very inexpensive. The executive recommended last year to be built in 27 and 28. The committee uh, agrees with that. Uh, but the rest of the sidewalk from Falls Road all the way over to basically Seven Locks Road, uh, uh, the council last year said start the design in FY 27 28 and do the land acquisition and construction in, in uh, 29 through 32. Uh, the 
the executive would recommend that second, much larger phase be delayed by two years, and the committee is saying no to that. Uh, Summit Avenue extension, um, actually that was just came forward recently, so that hasn't been delayed as yet. The executive is recommending a one-year delay, and the com committee is saying no to that. Uh, the Capitol Crescent Trail Tunnel, um, it's, uh, it was uh, initially programmed for it to be finished in uh, FY 27, consistent with, not, actually not initially, most recently uh, in 27, which is more or less consistent with the Purple Line schedule is right now within several months uh, of opening. Uh, last year the council delayed it by one year to be completion by the end of FY 28. Uh, the executive had recommend, had, has recommends this time uh, uh, delaying it beyond six years. However, the, um, and the cost estimate has gone up from $55.5 million to over $82 million. But that's also partly because of the delay beyond six years. Uh, the uh, Department of Transportation is applying for a raise grant from the feds that would, um, that would um, get $45 million if we're successful, and that would require a $24 million match for a total of $69 million, uh, but that's based on not having delayed the project, really. Um, and so what the committee has recommended is to um, basically reflect that in the CIP, and not only that, to actually to re-accelerate the, um, the project so it was on the schedule that it was before, which would be finished in FY27, more or less consistent with the Purple Line's current schedule. Um, so it's actually in terms of cost uh, to the county, if we're successful with the grant, big if, uh, it would go from $55.5 million down to $24 million, so saving the $31 million there uh, in terms of the CIP. And then finally, Observation Drive um, <laughs> extended. Um, and if, if you, the simplest way to look at this is, is to look at the diagram which is on page, circle number, sorry, um, 60, 60, 60, circle number 60. You can see on circle 60, uh, Observation Drive is actually a couple projects. It extends Observation Drive, Northman's current terminus in North Germantown. Um, across Great Seneca Creek to West Old Baltimore Road and eventually to um, Stringtown Road. And it also includes uh, the extension of Little Seneca Parkway and its widening to its master plan four lane width from uh, 355 over to Observation Drive. Uh, a couple of years ago, in, in a way of trying to keep this part of this project going on schedule and to uh, keep the cost in the shorter term down, it was divided into two phases. Phase one, would build the extension of, uh, of Observation Drive north to uh, West Old Baltimore Road and just beyond that to where Little Seneca Parkway would come in, then make the connection of Little Seneca Parkway over to existing Little Seneca Parkway and have that all be four lanes and have the rest of it north of Little, of Little Seneca Parkway uh, be often further in the future. Um, the executive had recommended um, uh, delaying the project yet another year in his, um, in his recommended CIP. And that, in fact, the project has already been delayed uh, two years even before that, so that would be a three-year delay. Uh, in investigating this with the department, we've, we realized that uh, the, the production schedule they were following would actually have a delay to two more years, not one year. So the executive's recommendation is out of date. Uh, when I went to committee uh, eight days ago, um, Councilmember Balcom pressed the department on this and said, is there any way you can get this so that it's only delayed one year? <laughs> as opposed to two years. And they have gone back and they, what they've done is they've split phase one into two parts, phase 1A and for phase 1-2B. And phase 1A can be done uh, with only the one year, one year further delay. Uh, and what that involves is just extending uh, Observation Drive north to West Old Baltimore Road and stopping there. Um, phase 1B would, uh, would start to work on the design but it would take about a year longer. So the, the goal is to keep uh, phase 1A, so it's only the one year delay. Phase 1B would be about basically a two year delay. So it's a compromise between what the executive sent over mm -hmm. and what the department really felt actually could be done. And that's it. And that's questions. It. Uh, well, first, uh, turn it over to Director Conklin. Just on the, uh, excuse me, on observation drive, the packets referencing the phase 1B would be. Um, constructed in 29 and 30. We actually think it's able to be started in 28 and completed in 29. Oh. Uh, it's a little bit different between the notes and the 
latter part of the packet and what's said here, but oh, we're I hoping to have the whole project apologize finished at the same time. So Glenn may be clairvoyant that it's 30, <laughs> but we haven't yet uh, given up on 29. <laughs> I welcome clarification to the amendment, <laughs> yes. Uh, Council Member Stewart. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say a thank you to um, the staff and Director Conklin and everyone at the Department of Transportation for your hard work on this. Um, as I think my colleagues can tell, the T&E committee spent a great deal of time <laughs> going through um, each of these items, and I know we'll have to continue to revisit them as we go through the budget, but I, I just appreciate the work that went into that. And I want to thank um, my colleague, Council Member, Council Vice President Friedson, um, for his advocacy on the North Bethesda entrance. And I'm glad the committee was able to keep that in the budget. So, thank you. Could I add one more thing? I'm sorry, uh, Chris pointed out that I skipped over a project. Uh, the Forest Lawn Passageway, the underpass under George Avenue between Forest Lawn Metro Station and the northwest corner, northeast corner of uh, Forest Lawn Road in Georgia, uh, that's already been delayed by uh, two years. Um, and the executive recommended a further delay of one year, and the committee said no to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Balcom. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you both for working on this. I, I think it's um, really important to move this project forward, and I think this uh, the solution of splitting out phase one uh, so we can get started is really great, and I know that the community is really anxious to get this moving, so thank you, uh, Director Conklin, for, for coming up with this solution. I, I do just want to say that um, it's in phase one is critical to happen. Um, phase two is now up in the air, and I, I know that and I recognize that. Uh, and so when we look next year at the full CIP, we have to look at uh, increased capacity in in Clarksburg and so I'm hoping that we can all do that I know that there's going to be a master plan amendment uh, for Clarksburg uh, but this is just a, um, a critical to, to make happen so um, thank you all for your work on this uh, Vice President Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the T&E committee. Thank you to uh, colleagues actually uh, uh, have worked very closely with uh, Council President on many transportation related issues over the past four years and now uh, two additional colleagues who represent areas, uh, part of which uh, I previously represented for the past four years and restoring the uh, schedule uh, to Capitol Crescent Trail Tunnel, Bradley Boulevard, Tuckerman Lane, Falls Road, Goldsboro Road, uh, North Bethesda Metro and 7th Avenue Extended, which I don't currently represent, but spent quite a lot of time in the last four years representing and is now ably uh, represented by Councilmember Stewart. Uh, these are really important. These are overwhelmingly pedestrian and bikeway improvements. They're at the core of our Vision Zero priorities some of which have been delayed for decades, uh, others have been delayed for years, uh, and uh, it's really important that we move forward uh, on them. It's not lost on me that if you look at the cuts in the transportation CIP, they are overwhelmingly in District 1 and in what was previously District 1 in areas that uh, are now represented by uh, these other uh, colleagues. Uh, and so, you know, certainly we have a lot of work to do as we uh, take up these uh, issues uh, moving forward, but I'm just very grateful uh, to the Transportation Environment Committee who uh, dug so deeply into these projects, worked closely with the uh, department and uh, with Dr. Orlin and uh, is uh, moving forward with these projects uh, so we can maintain these commitments to the community and to our Vision Zero priorities. So thank you very much. The t Committee is a shovels on the ground committee, so yes, we keep, we keep doing that. Council Member Sales. Um, thank you, President Glass. Um, I just had a, a quick question. Um, I do want to echo the sentiments of my colleagues, thanking you all for your work in getting to this point. I just had a question about the um, some of the lower priority projects that took up um, a significant amount of funding. Can you um, explain how um, you arrived at the uh, projects that were more that were lower priority and how these um, decisions aligned with the uh, vision zero guidelines uh, I, I can attempt to do that um, you know as the executive branch is going through all of the CIP priorities there are needs in other areas of the CIP 
transportation is typically one of the two largest um, areas of investment in the county CIP, with schools being the second largest. Sometimes we're larger, sometimes they're larger. So as we are looking to meet all the priorities across those categories, we looked at projects that had previously been delayed, had very large price tags compared to the geographic area that, they, that was served, um, and projects that may not have had a lot of strong public interest in recent times. So clearly if a project gets delayed, often that will occur. So that's really where we looked at um, which projects might uh, be delayed to pr provide those resources for the projects that uh, were deemed needed to be funded at this time. I, I think uh, Mary Beck with OMB, <clears throat> one other thing that you're really seeing here, and we've talked about this before, is sort of a structural problem that we have with the CIP. The uh, public schools is very front-loaded, and the problem is when we get to the later years, MCPS still has needs, but they weren't programmed. And so we have sort of a cascading domino effect where things that were in the back get pushed out further. And that is why you tend to see transportation, as Chris mentioned, it's the number two um, category of funding for the CIP, so that's where the money is. But also, it tends to be in the back, and when things get bumped, it gets bumped further out. And I, I guess the one other thing that I would say is that when the executive was making some of the choices, we were trying to take a racial equity lens in terms of what stayed in and what got deferred. You can't always do that because sometimes there are bulges in particular years. Forest Glen is a project like that. Um, but those are some of the factors. Thank you for that. I just wanted to make sure that we are prioritizing like the high um, risk areas for Vision Zero purposes when we're thinking about deferring projects. Thank you. Uh, and Councilmember Sales, I appreciate the, the point you bring up because that has been a focus of mine and it was a focus of the committees with respect to Observation Drive, recognizing the transportation disparities that exist, wanting to help a particular community that needs it quite a lot. And so I appreciate that. Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. What was the total of the restoration added in committee? And what does that do to the to the gap for the CIP? Um, I don't have the gap chart with me. I'm sorry, I didn't think to bring it. I, uh, I know that the Capitol Crescent Trail uh, one alone actually doesn't restore 31 million of that 89 million. So I'd say the difference is pro probably close to the difference. I would guess about 60 some million. As far as the, what was restored? Or, okay. Yeah. Transportation would still be under what it was in the approved CIP, but not, not nearly as much. Okay. And uh, I'd be perfect. It's working on reconciliation see, for the last 33 years. Frankly, some of this stuff's going to get delayed. Right. But, it, but just as you did in the ed Education and Culture Committee with schools, we decided not to take any of the cuts at this point. The commit the T &E Committee decided to take very few of these cuts in, in transportation. Well, we did take some cuts. We took we took in schools. Yeah, we took we took uh, very small, but yeah. And, and there's more coming that just came over today. But I know there's we'll, one on we'll, the college. Yeah, we'll take yeah. that up. And we yeah we took some on the college side. Um, okay, I just you know I think I know we're not taking action today, but I just want to restate that you know for my for my position, it's going to be you know the reconciliation list. It's always hard, but this is going to be particularly hard uh, this year, particularly if we don't have other revenues. Um, and so obviously we have a bill before us to, to consider that, but just as f from my perspective, I'm not going to, you know, just don't want to signal that while we're going to probably not remove anything today, as I won't necessarily be able to support all of this depending on what happens with the whole picture. And just, I think it's really important to just say that on the record. So I appreciate the t &E's committee's work. Um, and uh, we'll certainly have to look at all of this holistically. So, and if you could just get that gap, we'll just we'll update the gap chart. I'll you send, work with Keith and get get that to my office. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Jawando. I'll, I'll add that I think the the Education and Culture Committee and the Transportation and Environment Committee are in a very similar place, recognizing the importance of those projects. Uh, and as Director. Uh, 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 Dr. Orland, director too, uh, Dr. Orland uh, noted, uh, we did, the committee did accept some of the executive recommendation 
uh, his cuts. Uh, what we're highlighting are the large restorations, uh, very similar to what the ENC committee did as well, uh, recognizing that they're all important. And uh, we know that level setting, we're going to have some tough conversations uh, about the CIP. And despite all of the committees, or in this case the ENC and T&E committees, uh, desire to restore as much as possible, um, that will likely not be able to happen for either committee. Councilmember Balcom. Yes, thank you. And I appreciate uh, Councilmember Jawando's views on we can't have everything all the time, all at once, right? Uh, but I do want to just ma make a plug for transportation. It's, it's not simply just roads and transit. This is uh, an economic development imperative. We have to get people from point A to point B. Our entire budget rests on having a strong, vibrant economy, and transportation capacity is a, a critical part of that, as well as um, our safety on our roadways and, and pedestrian safety. So just I, I fully accept uh, where you're going, and I know that we have very tough decisions to make. I just wanted to state that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Alvernos. Thank you. Great work, as always, by the committee. Thank you, Dr. Worland. Good to see you, uh, Director Conklin. So uh, first, as a macro level question, obviously, we're concerned about what's happening at the state level with the proposed deficit in their operating budget. And that's going to have a cascading effect um, on a variety of statewide projects, but that could cross over and impact the timing of some of our local projects. Obviously, it's impossible to fully know or anticipate what further reductions there might be or delays at the state level, but could you just talk a little bit about uh, what you are forecasting or how we can prepare? Um, because just as the second part of my question, we obviously we're counting on the tolling revenue uh, for future CIP projects, and that project is, as we learned, no longer moving forward with the current vendor. And the jury's out on where we go from here, and it's up to Governor Moore to decide. Um, but that lack of revenue, obviously, is, is of concern, and it could be compounded by um, future deficits and what we're seeing at the state level. I can give a little preview. We don't quite know the state aid situation yet. We expect to have more clarity on that next week or the week after uh, as the General Assembly winds down this year's session. There are a couple of elements that are encouraging. So uh, in last year's General Assembly session, there was action to provide some state lottery generated revenues to our bus rapid transit program. So we are going to be factoring that in into revisions you're likely to see in the coming weeks. In terms of the opportunity lanes, I think it's evident that that's not going to occur in FY23-24. I believe we had revenue starting in FY23 in the approved CIP, so we're going to be making some adjustments to at least give us room to consider what happens with that project over the next year, so not, not drawing on that resource in the next couple years. Uh, as you mentioned, we don't yet know the state's direction. We had some conversation with state officials as early as last week that they're still figuring out their plan to move a project forward uh, for 270 and 495. Some of the funding commitments that we counted on for the opportunity lanes were related to a specific provider. Some are not, so we don't yet know how that will work itself out. So we're probably going to need all of FY24 to understand what happens with that funding stream. And we'll be coming up with some adjustments to projects, not the ones you've seen here today, but other projects that are affected by that. Uh, and hopefully have that before you in the next two weeks so that it can be considered before the budget adoption. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll take, I'll, I'll emphasize the good news you shared at the beginning of that comment and <laughs> brace myself for the bad news. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's the reality um, just that, that, that these are expensive projects and the revenue's got to come from somewhere. So thank you very, I yield back to you, Mr. President. Uh, I appreciate that question also. So just for situational awareness and level setting for what might come in two weeks' time, the uh, budget reductions that will be proposed are for projects that are not currently before us. I don't think it affects anything that was in this set of amendments. Okay, that's Dr. right. Um, yeah, the, the two projects that are affected are the 55 Central BRT and the 355 North and South BRT. Uh, the, 20, the, the 23 money and 24 money is the design money for the north and the south. Um, 
the central piece doesn't start on FY24 anyway, but it's $170 million, which is, you know, if the project, if the tolling revenue is not there, that's $170 million that we have to find. Uh, it does not affect, however, the assumptions for the Beersville Road BRT, for example, because there was no uh, opportunity lanes toll revenue in that. that. That project is likely to come before you, though, as we're combining the BIPA and Veers Mill Road project and have advanced design and better cost estimates for all. Veers Mill or 355? Veers Mill Road, Mill. Okay. BIPA, and BRT are likely to come back before you as well. Okay. Well, I can hear Council Member Fani Gonzalez thanking you for that. Or, or maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, not seeing anybody else uh, wanting to make a comment, uh, we'll support this uh, uh, without objection for now. Again, of course, knowing that we have future conversations um, down the road. Uh, so thank you, thank you all, and thank you, Ms. Beck, also for joining. Okay, so uh, we will now turn to the consent calendar, uh, which is as long as the day has been. Um, is there a motion to move the consent calendar? So moved. Uh, moved by Councilmember Juwanda, seconded by Councilmember Albernaz. All those in favor of the consent calendar? That is unanimous. And Councilmember Sales would like to make a comment. Thank you, President Glass. Um, just wanted to briefly um, make remarks on the resolution that was included in the consent calendar. I wanted to thank um, the president in addition to the other co-sponsors. Um, I feel like it's very important to um, draw attention to this legislation, to this resolution. Over the last few years and with increasing frequency, the transgender non-conforming and non-binary community has come under attack. These attacks are coming from both state governments and individuals, resulting in hundreds of members of the community having their existence, mental and physical well-being threatened. In recent years, more than 13 states have passed regulations restricting access to life-saving health care, limiting access to sanitation facilities, and generally attacking the community for simply being themselves. These legislative attacks have also emboldened physical attacks on the transgender community, resulting in more than 300 people being killed over the last decade, the overwhelming majority of them being people of color. Right here in Montgomery County, we lost Kiana Blakeney and Zella Ziona to violence and several of our drag queen story hours have been targeted by known hate groups such as the Proud Boys at times causing violent interactions with members of the community. It is important that in the face of these vicious and intolerant attacks that we continue to stand up and speak in support of the transgender, gender non-conforming, and non-binary communities. Again, I want to thank my colleagues, Council Members Mink, Council Member Stewart, and Council President Glass for working with me on this resolution and the rest of the council for co-sponsoring. This resolution sends a clear message that Montgomery County rejects all forms of hate and reaffirms the county's commitment to acceptance and understanding. And I yield and want to thank everyone once again. Thank you very much, Council Member Sales. Uh, council Member Mink. Thank you. Um, I want to express my appreciation to Councilmember Sales for spearheading this effort. Um, and uh, it was great to be able to work on it with you, along with uh, Councilmember Stewart and Council President Glass. And at this time, as you mentioned, Councilmember Sales, we are seeing the transgender community truly under attack. And I mean that very literally. Um, we're going to see that in uh, rapidly increasing now in the wake of the Nashville shooting where we are getting word that the shooter may have been transgender. Um, 
this after nearly every shooting mass shooting that that makes the news these days we start to see claims out of the right that the shooter is transgender and it's never true it's never true but this time it might be and we are already seeing the the attacks ramping up never mind the fact that everybody else you know 99.9 percent .9 of the mass shootings are perpetrated of course um, by cisgender folks um so it's a very very dangerous and scary time for my excuse me, many of our transgender uh, and non-binary community members um, here and across the country. And it's extremely important that all of us use every platform and opportunity that we have to be vocal and proactive in our support. It's no longer enough just to say that we are not part of the problem. We have to be proactively part of the solution. And um, uh, I want to reassure everyone that we are very aware that that includes, you know, uh, policy action, legislative action. Um, this resolution here is a, a sign that we are moving towards taking it and continuing as many of those actions as possible. I want to commend MCPS. Um, we've been in, in conversation with them about um, looking for them to really ramp up their proactive support, uh, their messaging. Uh, on behalf of especially the uh, the LGBTQ plus and especially the transgender community, uh, and to um, you know not shy away from it. And in conversations with them, certainly you know I've heard concerns that they know that there will be backlash. And as I expressed to them, we have to demonstrate that we are willing to take that backlash because we don't want it to fall upon the shoulders of those who are most impacted. And, and I very much appreciate that they recently sent out, uh, sent home to families uh, an affirmative and unequivocal statement of support for LGBTQ plus students and community members, um, as well as an assurance that our curriculum does and will continue to include the LGBTQ plus uh, community um, without without apology or additional explanation. And, and I truly appreciate that that uh, the decision to send that message. And, um, and if I may, with the council presidents and with council member sales permission, just briefly read through the action portion of the resolution. Thank you. Um, the county council for Montgomery County, Maryland approves the following resolution. One, Montgomery County condemns all anti-transgender acts, urges all residents to exercise compassion and understanding, and calls for neighboring jurisdictions to condemn hate and violence against the LGBTQIA plus community. Two, Montgomery County affirms its commitment to work proactively to make our county one that is fully inclusive of the transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming, and wider LGBTQIA plus community. Three, Montgomery County affirms that people of all gender identities and gender expressions are welcome. And four, Montgomery County supports LGBTQIA plus friendly events such as Drag Story Hour and Pride Month and recognizes them as important and joyful ways to celebrate the diversity of our community. And that is who Montgomery County is and strives to be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Stewart. Okay, thank you. And I want to also acknowledge and thank Council Member Sales for bringing this forward and working with Council Member Meek and Council President Glass. Um, the point I'm going to make is maybe a little um, <laughs> more mundane, but a very important one for the functioning of our body. Um, there were, uh, there are seven supplemental appropriations in this consent agenda um, that represent over 31 million dollars being taken out of our general funds. Um, and I just want to say a huge thank, thanks to Craig Howard for doing what Council Member Balcom and I have been asking for for the last couple of months, that there is a cover page to these supplementals um, identifying where they're coming from, what they're for, and the impact it will have on our reserves. I think as we, uh, you know, we don't need to go through all these and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them and take action on them at another time, but I did want to call my colleagues' attention to the fact that the um, supplemental appropriations are being shown differently here. And I would just again call upon the county exec's office to send these over uh, in a different way so they are packaged together and that's how that we're getting them from them. But I just wanted to say thank you very much to the central staff um, for putting, putting this in a much better way for us to consider in the future. So thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, Councilmember Stewart's uh, and, and Balcom's eyes on the consent calendar and Councilmember Sales and Mink's hearts in the consent calendar and that is shared by all of us here uh, and our full bodies will return at 7 o'clock tonight uh, when we hear from 60 more of our neighbors about Bill 1523 and 1623 and until then we are adjourned. <laughs>